What's up, everybody? Welcome to The Church Split, where we help you think biblically, challenge the status quo, and of course, help you escape your church's echo chamber. You guys know what we do here. Now, if you do want to, go ahead and subscribe, hit like, do all that stuff, and give some love for your boys who are here representing their alternate positions. So, for those of you guys who do not know what you're here for, you should know what you're here for, but just in case you don't, we are here for a debate between alternate media versus Buck Rogers and the Black Doctor. These guys are here. One is going to be arguing that Christians should practice the Torah, and the other ones are going to be arguing in that you don't need to practice the Torah. And this is something that's been hotly contested, hotly debated, and it's something that's been getting more popularity recently. So we definitely wanted the opportunity to do this. And of course, don't forget to go follow what they do, follow their uh, various platforms. I'm sure they'll be a blessing to you. And you might find things you agree with, you might find things to disagree with. But that's the whole point of the church split, guys, is that we are trying to unite the divided body by allowing us to engage in debate, to engage in discussion without the need to separate, be hateful or spiteful. So despite whatever happens in this debate, uh, one, I expect there it to remain respectful, but I do expect there to be blood. So, uh, <laughs> and if there is indeed blood, uh, I just really, really hope it's good. But guys, honestly, lead. we were all bantering and talking so much uh, beforehand, we get along so well. So honestly, anything that's said here is only to better one another and to challenge one another's positions, not necessarily to hate one another. So with that being said, uh, we are going to be doing this. And I, what I want to do is introduce our contestants for tonight's event. One, I have Bradley Vasquez with Alternate Media. He is the lead apologist and co-founder of Alternate Media, educated at Adat Bonet Olam, I hope I said that right, in biblical studies with a concentration in rabbinic literature and philosophy. Seamus McGowan is the lead historian and co-founder of Alternate Media, educated at, uh, yeah, at Alternate Media, educated and current student at Liberty University for Biblical Studies and Theology with a concentration in Judaic Studies. And then we have Jeremiah Short, also known as the Black Doctor. He is a pastoral interim and interim past, uh, youth pastor for First Presbyterian Church, double major from Falconer University, attending, or he was attending seminary at Westminster, but now at Beeson Divinity School. And then we have Noel Roberts. He is a teacher, a preacher, and evangelist with a Bible and theology degree from Mid-America Nazarene University. I was joking around with these two gentlemen uh, before the event that if the Torah thing gets old, we have a guy from both a Nazarene university and a guy from a Calvinist university. So if things get too boring, we'll just turn it over <laughs> to soteriology and let these two hammer that out. So um, one thing I did want to point out here, though, because of that, I find it really cool that you have two guys who disagree in one area, but are also joining forces in another. And this is the way that the, that the body of Christ should work. We should be able to disagree on various things while locking arms on things that we do agree on as well. So I think that's important. Um, so I, this is the reality. Uh, I always crack up in Acts chapter 15 when it said there was no small disagreement among them. <laughs> so um, I think that's okay. So with that being said, I want to give you guys each time to introduce yourselves and what you guys do outside of my introduction here. And I will start with Jeremiah, then I will go to Noel, then Seamus, and then Brad, okay? So go ahead, start us off, Jeremiah. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As most of you guys know me, I'm Jeremiah, the Black Doctor. Um, from You guys can mainly find me here on my YouTube at the Black Doctor, but also at Black Doctor 21, that's my TikTok. And you can also find me on my corresponding Instagram. Just follow uh, just my, my bio or my link tree. It has links to all of that. Um, as was said, I am a student at Beeson Divinity School, uh, formerly at Westminster, pastoral intern, um, uh, interim youth minister, budding apologist, the whole shebang. So <laughs> I, I'm really excited for this debate. And um, I mean, of course, as you guys know, bow ties are cool. So rocking things out tonight. I'm really excited for this debate. It's time to have fun. Did you just make a Doctor Who reference? Yes, I am. That's how I got my name. <laughs> uh, oh my goodness. 
Okay, Jeremiah just got a hundred times cooler than all of you. So, uh, <laughs> um, all right, sweet. Well, with that being said, uh, Noel, can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Noel Roberts. I'm a uh, Marine Corps veteran and a preacher, teacher, and evangelist. I recently graduated from Mid American Nazarene with a Bible and theology major, as Will said. But my emphasis is making men Christ centered becoming like Christ, being imitators of Christ. Christ is first and foremost whom we ought to glorify because he is our redemption. And we've been given a ministry of reconciliation because of what he's done through his death, burial, and resurrection. If you want to follow me, uh, you can hop onto my link tree uh, or any of my other social medias through Instagram, TikTok, and a few others on YouTube with the Wheaton Terrace podcast. We just started our Men of the Way podcast where we talk about all sorts of different topics focused on Christ. Now, one of the things I find interesting with Noel is that, one, uh, you, you, we have a couple uh, military vets in here, but then also, dude, you're, uh, you got canceled once on TikTok because of times. your... Uh, yeah, because your pro-life positions and some of your spiciness. So just so everyone knows, Noel is not a person who's scared to get in the ring. He's not afraid of the internet mob. Uh, he has high respect there from me. Uh, so good job, man. I appreciate Seamus. it. Tell us about yourself. For those of you who are not familiar with what we do here at the Church Split, you might not know who he is, but everyone else should know who he is if you're a regular listener. <clears throat> well, hello. Uh, so as he said, I'm Seamus. Uh, how it's spelled on the bottom is not how it's pronounced. Um, and I also am a uh, Marine uh, vet. I'm still technically in as a reservist combat engineer. And uh, as you know, I studied at Liberty University, uh, still a current student there with a concentration in Judaic studies. It's basically a fancy way of saying a Bible history degree. Um, and uh, yeah, me and Brad, we started Alternate Media a little while ago. I'll probably tell you more about that. But as far as just myself, uh, you know, we run a YouTube page together. I do have a TikTok account, but it's not nearly as popular or as cool as Brad's is. Uh, I'm, I'm more... I'm more the guy that works a lot behind the scenes, uh, doing a lot of the research papers and uh, getting everything together. So I'm not as out in the public as, as uh, for alternate media. He's, he's more the face. But uh, anyway, I'm happy to be here. Uh, really, really glad to uh, have, have this finally have this conversation. We've been planning it for what feels like months. Um, and so it's really good. Uh, plus, I just haven't gotten to speak to any of you guys uh, like like in a conversation style outside of texting in a long time. And I prefer this and I'm really happy that we're here doing this. So thank you for having us on. Absolutely. In fact, uh, Seamus, I think it's a shame that you're not more public, not the fact that Brad doesn't have a beautiful beard, but just the very fact that uh, you actually do add a big point, big part of the, the crew. Uh, Brian, he's behind the scenes, literally here, my co-host, and uh, it would not be the same without Brian. Uh, I, I added him full time on the podcast uh, every for every episode, much to his chagrin. But um, he does add a special <laughs> element. Although ours is weird, he does the back background stuff, and I do the research, so that's fun. Um, I, some of it, he does other research. We do, we actually work very well as a team. Uh, just depends on the topic. But Brad, tell us now about you. Uh, well, it's wonderful to be here. Um, this is actually my second debate here on the church split. Uh, so, you know, for those of you who are curious about my first one, I debated uh, baptism with a, uh, a former Baptist who had turned Catholic. That was an interesting discussion. Um, <clears throat> so uh, for me, like Seamus said, I'm um, one of the co-founders here for Alternate Media. Uh, the only reason that my page has more of a following than his on TikTok is because I have been active on TikTok for longer. Um, he's catching up real quick. And actually, I think at this point, he's got more content posted than I do. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm, I'm super stoked about this discussion uh, because of my own personal history um, being that I used to oppose my own current theology uh quite fiercely. So I'm always interested to see if someone can uh, contrive an argument that I haven't myself thought of. And I'm, I'm very hopeful considering the two gentlemen that we have on the panel here. Um, I'm, I'm confident that, that they'll be able to bring something to the table that will excite me. And I'm obviously excited about that. 
Awesome. So, um, well, guys, I am excited for us to move forward on this. I was showing uh, some of the comments, and there's definitely some people who are absolutely pumped for this. I'm seeing a lot of different rooting on different sides. Uh, so that's always the best when, we, when people are engaged in the discussion. Yo, so, yo, Captain Dadpool is watching, just saying. <laughs> Captain Dadpool, yeah. Let's go. <laughs> um, although, Noel, I want you to know that uh, – Oh man, where to go, Brian? You clicked something. Uh, that somebody said, "I hope you enjoy your last bacon meal." So was, yeah, I noticed that. Really <laughs> I was thoroughly the comments good. are so funny right now. <laughs> I know. Well, that just goes to show our. It was our specifically comments. bacon wrapped shellfish. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to say that I do find it, it is funny because I can tell that all of us are definitely like cut ups because the audience that we have drawn is a bunch of cut ups. So mm. I do I find that a lot of fun. Uh, not much people with you know uh, their pride firmly shoved up anyway. Um, so <laughs> with that being said, guys, this is actually, uh, it is a formal debate as much as I'm joking around and having a good time. This part is where the debate is actually going to begin. This is where I shut up. You guys talk. And now we get to hear the arguments on various sides. Uh, just so everyone is aware, we have been playing this for a long time. I do appreciate all the contestants being willing to work on everyone's schedule, especially mine. Mine is probably the most difficult. I am aware of that. So thank you, my friends. Uh, the other thing is, is I also want to make sure I everyone's aware when it came to opening and closing statements, I gave each of the participating sides uh, their choice to either split the time or to use it wholly as a single participant and switch later. So um, what you're going to see here is you're going to see two different strategies, and that's, I think, completely okay. I left it up to the defending sides. So with that being said, we have now a 10-minute uh, opening statement on both sides. So we will go first with you, Jeremiah. Uh, it's the affirmative isn't it? Oh, wait, no, you're right. I apologize. Uh, so <laughs> Bre uh, your code, totally right. Uh, Seamus, is, do you want to go first? Yeah. Yeah. I got the opening and Brad's got the closing. All righty. So. Let's do it. All right. All right. Forgive me. I'm reading here, but uh, here we go. <clears throat> Firstly, thank you, Will and the Church Split for hosting this debate tonight. I pray that this discussion will be helpful to any listeners and informative enough to aid in anybody currently wrestling with this issue. So the question is, is Torah observance relevant slash required of the modern Christian? To which we at Alton Immediate answer in the affirmative. We are quite often accused of working for our salvation, but rest assured nothing could be further from the truth. However, even our opponents would be in a position to agree with us that obedience to the Messiah and to God are to be expected. James put it best when he said, faith without works is a dead faith. This obedience is expected of you as a Christian. Obedience is not only evidence of the faith that you have, but it shows your covenant devotion to Messiah and in your obedience, you become a light to the world, sharing the gospel with your actions before words. But our opponents reject the scriptural definition of sin. Sin, according to scripture, it, 1 John 3, 4 gave us its very definition. Sin is the transgression of the law. Indeed, sin is lawlessness. Paul in Romans 7, 12 said he wouldn't know what sin is except through the Torah. And equally, the Torah also defines what sanctification is, living a holy life. Romans 2, 13, it is not the hearers of the Torah who are righteous before God, but the doers who will be justified. Now, as you will soon see, our opponents are going to inconsistently apply the Greek word for law, nomos, to mean only Torah as they see fit. For instance, they will likely insist on its reference to the Torah wherever nomos is spoken of negatively, while conversely insisting any place where nomos is spoken of in a positive light, that it merely refers to an arbitrary definition such as the moral law or the law of Christ, both of which find no scriptural definition or basis outside of Torah itself. Suddenly, the word nomos is a vague feel-good fluff word for the only laws that I like. For example, in 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Our opponents are going to uh, say that this application doesn't mean Torah. It means the law of Christ, as if Christ's law is not Torah, which, by the way, at Alternate Media, we affirm that it is. Uh, so what is the law of Christ? We are, uh, what are the covenant stipulations beholden to the Christian? Our answer is obedience to the teachings of the Master Yeshua, our Messiah. And it is a fact that not only was Yeshua a Torah-observant Jew perfectly, thereby giving us the perfect example with which to strive, uh, but he also taught Torah along with its interpretations to his disciples. In fact, discipleship in the first century is defined as imitating your teacher at every aspect. Paul affirmed this in 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, when he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Therefore, according to 1 John 2, 3 through 4, as a disciple of the master, we should do the things that he did if we love him. And our master did Torah. 
In fact, if Yeshua had violated one small aspect of the Torah at all, it would have disqualified him as the Messiah. And if he taught anybody else to also violate the Torah, he would have disqualified from being the Messiah. So then the teachings of the Messiah are Torah. He said so himself in Matthew 5.17 that he did not come to abolish the law, but to establish it. Plerusai is often translated as fulfill. It means to keep or to establish, to perform or to affirm. It in no way implies Torah being done away with or replaced. And in case there might be any confusion on what Yeshua meant here, he clarified by juxtaposing fulfill with abolished in order to concretely affirm that the Torah isn't going anywhere anytime soon, at least not until heaven and earth have passed away. Another noteworthy error in our opposition's argument you are likely to observe as the discussion unfolds is an over-reliance on the words of Paul. We at alternate media hold authoritative statements from the Messiah himself as the cornerstone of the foundation for our position. Statements like Matthew 5.17, Matthew 7.21, or Matthew 23.1 we believe there's little to no reason for the discussion concerning the place of Torah in the life of the believer to move beyond these words, yet this rarely occurs in such discussions. Most frequently, such passages are rapidly sidestepped, likely due to their condemning and cancerous nature to the anti-Torah position. We find no precedence in any way to view or utilize the words of Paul to abrogate the words of the Messiah himself, and yet this is how Paul's words are often applied, albeit ignorantly and without precedence. As it stands, the nature of this debate is such that those opposing the Torah-centric position will jump through a list of statements made by Paul and the Torah defendant will have to chase them through this chain of selective references to the epistles. Each time one of Paul's statements is addressed and explained in its proper context, the opposition will not concede the verse, but rather, as with the statements of Yeshua, simply move on to the next in hope that if one of the statements can be found to legitimately condemn Torah, they can retain the entire list to include those that have been explained to support Torah. This is a common fallacy that our opponents are adequately familiar with called shifting the goalpost. It should be noted by those watching that every time they move to another Pauline statement without first demonstrating the pro Torah explanation to be false, that the verse has been found not to support their position, hence the eager nature with which they will move from it. The epistles are often quoted at us as if we're unfamiliar with them. But let me assure you this moment that very few people have studied Paul and his life more scrupulously than we. Paul uh, stressed that nobody can earn salvation by their works alone, and so we are saved by grace through faith, and this we affirm. But as Paul said, this does not give you license to continue in sin, Romans 6.1. Therefore, the changed life of the saved individual should reflect an attempt to achieve a life as close to sinlessness as possible for that individual, Romans 6.19. Jesus himself also said, be perfect. Well, what is perfection? As previously stated, perfection is a carefully laid out in the Torah. And Paul also affirmed that the Torah is perfection, Romans 7.12. We often hear that only the moral law remains, the ceremonial and the civil do not. Well, first of all, the Torah makes no such divisions and treats every law equally as moral. Just as God is one, so his Torah is one, one full law, all of it moral. After all, God gave a command, regardless of the nature of the command, wouldn't you agree that to disobey a direct order from God is a moral issue? Moreover, how does one determine which of the laws are moral and civil? For example, one normally places the laws against homosexual activity as moral, but the punishment for the sin is the same as the punishment for violating the Sabbath day, death. Surely anything with a death penalty attached to it is a moral issue. And yet for some reason, Christians seem to place the Sabbath as either civil or, uh, or ceremonial, and there is no universal agreement as to which category it belongs, because the Torah does not create these arbitrary definitions or divisions which Christians have created and imposed on the Torah. The Torah, in fact, seems to treat all laws as a single entity. There is to be one law between you and the stranger that resides among you, Deuteronomy. According to this verse, Jew or Gentile doesn't matter if you're within the covenant, the Torah's lifestyle applies to you. Paul again reiterates this when he said, in Christ there is no Jew and Gentile. He did not mean that Jews become Gentiles or that they both disappear, but rather all Gentiles entering the covenant are treated as equals. They are treated as if they are Jews. In Ephesians 2, he calls us fellow citizens of the promises. What promises? The promises made to Jews. There are no promises made to Gentiles. If you go back and re read Jeremiah and Ezekiel's prophecies concerning the new covenant, to whom is it made with? Israel and Judea, not to Gentiles. So Paul then makes the case that since no promise was made to the Gentiles, and yet he has witnessed the evidence that Gentiles are in fact saved, it makes the case that we've been grafted into Israel, Romans 11. Now, once we were far off, have been brought near, Ephesians 2, which then makes us covenant members, we become sons of Abraham. Many people don't realize that the term sons of Abraham is an idiom for convert. The process of converting is so difficult, in fact, that even a natural-born Jew would typically fail the test required of a Gentile. Peter said as much in Acts 15, Why then do we put God to the test by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither we nor our forefathers could bear? The yoke is not Torah. Torah is, to quote Deuteronomy, not too difficult for you. This yoke he speaks of is the incredibly difficult conversion process, something they've never had to experience, and a yoke they admit they likely wouldn't be able to bear. 
the context of Acts 15 is trying to answer the question of, is conversion necessary? And the answer is no. The conversion process was designed this way on purpose to keep Gentiles out as much as possible and to seriously test the authenticity of the proselyte. In summary, Paul discouraged conversion to Judaism as it wasn't necessary in the Messiah to do such a thing. Paul considered the saved Gentile to be a covenant member and that he should be accepted into the synagogue as an equal, as though he were a full convert. Paul did not, contrary to popular belief, discourage Torah practice. For Paul, Torah practice was only natural and implied. For James, it was expected that they eventually would come to Torah observance, as he stated in Acts 15, for Moses is preached in every synagogue every Sabbath. The early believers all thought of themselves as a sect within Judaism, not apart from it, and that now Gentiles are more than welcome to join in without the conversion process and would be expected to eventually be part of the Torah culture. In other words, we've been adopted by God into his family. Israel is his firstborn, and so that makes us a little brother. And in God's house, there are not two sets of rules. The adopted son is treated like the natural son, and the same rules apply equally and without favoritism to both children. Thank you. All righty, with a minute and a half to spare. Uh, all righty. So thank you so much for that, Seamus, for a very uh, well put and strongly articulated argument to set your grounds. With that being said, uh, there is now a 10 minute period for opening statements by the negative. So I believe, Jeremiah, you were going to open for your side. All right, Jeremiah, your time begins when you start speaking. Thank you all for being here tonight. We've come to address a very important subject, Torah observance. Basically, are Christians obligated to observe the 613 mitzvot given to Moses, specifically the kosher laws, the feast days, and the Saturday Sabbath for the sake of obedience? I propose that the answer is no. The way to demonstrate this position is to observe how the scriptures portray the covenants as well as lay out the purpose of the law of Moses. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. Paul asks the Galatians in verses 2 and 3, if they were seeking to be perfected by observance of the law, having first begun by the Spirit. He then points out that this position is untenable based on the covenant of grace in history and how it relates to the law. He notes that in the Abrahamic covenant, the gospel was preached to Abraham before the law was given. He was obedient without the specific Mosaic requirements given at Sinai. The Tanakh itself points out that righteousness cannot be achieved through the law, as Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, uh, co-referencing Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Righteousness, in any sense, comes by faith. The law, in contrast, only gives conditional commands, do this and live, and those who do not keep it are put under a curse. Now, we all have failed to keep the law perfectly, so we are all under the curse until Christ came to rescue us. We must not redefine perfection. I agree, we must not redefine perfection. And so Christ was perfect, sinless, and thus he was the only candidate to pay for our sins, as God in the flesh, as well as being the only one to perfectly fulfill the law and thus give us a perfect righteousness through imputation of faith. Speaking of the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant, in verses 15 through 29 of Galatians chapter 3, Paul contrasts the two, noting that the covenant with Moses does not annul the Abrahamic covenant. The Mosaic law, which comes 430 years afterwards through angels and an intermediary, Moses, was added for a specific reason, because of transgressions. It was also given for a specific time frame until the coming faith would be revealed. The Mosaic Covenant and all of the things characterizing it has a specific purpose, to be our pedagogue, to point us to Christ. And now that Christ has come, we are not under a pedagogue, as Galatians 3.25 says. We are not under the same covenant administration as Moses. You see, we often, if not all the time in scripture, see that the new covenant is contrasted with the Mosaic covenant, but expressed as the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant of grace or the covenant of promise. We see in the book of Hebrews, 
at the aspects of the new covenant, the better promises and priesthood, etc., are contrasted with the imperfection of the Levitical priesthood, the corresponding law, the imperfection and temporal sacrificial system, the commandment that is set aside, the sacrifices that cannot make perfect, and the flawed, obsolete, and passing away covenant, as we see in Hebrews chapter 7 through chapter 10. Therefore, Christians are not obligated to observe the sacrificial and judicial mitzvot. While we see in Romans chapter 2 and 3 that the moral law, which is placed within our hearts, continually applies as it has since creation. It is the basis for universal condemnation and is the law by which we fulfill by faith and love. Now, this position is also seen ecclesiastically in Acts chapter 15, where Gentiles are not required to keep the law, but to observe four restrictions. Now, these restrictions were not given for the sake of covenant obedience, you don't find that, or to prepare them to keep the Mosaic customs, you don't find that statement either, but for the sake of unity among their Jewish brothers, as we see later on in the following chapters. We finally see it in church history, where the earliest students of the apostles continually distinguished themselves from the Mosaic expression of law keeping. And so, in conclusion, the Christian is not mandated by Holy Writ to keep the Mosaic customs. They are shadows that point to the coming of Christ in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, and Hebrews chapter 10. So, can one keep them if they feel obligated to? Yeah, sure. But must they for the sake of covenant obedience? The scriptures proclaim an emphatic no. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremiah, for a very succinct approach to your position. You had a bigger challenge at share, uh, with sharing your opening statement time. So well done at building your case quickly. So uh, with that being said, Noel, your time begins when you start speaking. Now, the Torah observance Hebrew roots position is more than a simple matter of one's conscience, but a heretical demonstration of ignorance and rejection of the words, authority, and prophecy in Christ. Christ is made less authoritative despite having been sent by the Father and his own divinity as the Son of God. Through grand misinterpretation that bears only the appearance of holiness, but a deviance of the Holy Spirit through fleshly discipline, Christ's purposes are even equated with the very Pharisees that he condemned. The rabbinic traditions that have been arbitrarily added and supposed as the very words of God have now been placed on the shoulders of the Gentiles, not realizing that this is, as they will try to deny, a burden. They will say, we believe in Christ for salvation, but you're responsible for maintaining your salvation by doing the same works of the old covenant. To truly be clean, obedient, and free of paganism, demonstrating you truly have the Heavenly Father as your Father, you must demonstrate that by living according to the demands of the old covenant. Now, when you point this out that no one can fulfill the law perfectly, they will arbitrarily accuse you of antinomianism, which simply means lawlessness, that you can believe in God and hold no responsibility of obedience. It is perfectly reasonable to recognize our inability to keep the law perfectly and not be antinomians. This is a huge straw man by which alternate media have thrived, but is only a grand misrepresentation of covenant theology and the purpose of the Old Testament law. The new covenant supersedes the previous one in Christ Jesus by the authority of God the Father as prophesied in the law. This is why Hebrews 7.12 says, for when the priesthood is changed, of necessity there takes place a change of law also. God does not change, but his requirements can. Just as when Moses inquired of the Lord on behalf of Israel, God's nature did not change, but what followed went from wrath to grace. Much more demonstrated in the book of Genesis with the change of food laws pre-flood into post-flood before the law of Moses. For example, in the new covenant, Christ has declared all foods clean. It is also the view of alternate media eschatologically that the physical temple will be rebuilt and will in fact go back to temple practices of the old covenant. Yet the sacrifices of blood and bulls could not cleanse sin. They were, as Hebrews says, a demonstration of faith in the final, keyword final, sacrifice for our Christ Lord. Once for all time, the promises of Christ are retroactively applied by faith in Christ 
through the operation of the Spirit. If the stance of alternate media is true, then Christ's sacrifice was insufficient for believers to be fully saved and maintained by God, and abhorrently, sin still remains. This makes the spiritual reality a thing of the flesh, making a mockery of the testimony of all in Christ. Our bodies are living temples unto God. God is no longer far off, but dwells with us in our hearts. This is why Revelation testifies, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, because the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. God, who once resided in the Holy of Holies, has torn the veil which still lays over the eyes of the Jews today. Alternate media's views are decimated by Christ in that he puts to death the old covenant and its burdensome demands. Just as the Pharisees tried to manipulate Jesus regarding marriage, when a husband or wife dies, the other is freed of the covenant. Therefore, it is perfectly understandable that Christ is the guaranteeing of a new and better covenant. The Torah has done what it was ordained to do. That is why not a jot or tittle will be erased, but instead testifies that there is something after it, the Christ. Therefore, to go back to the old regulations would be no different than a grieving wife or husband trying to sustain a marriage with a corpse. Now, rejection of the covenant theology is innately tied to the authority of Christ as the one prophetically sent by God the Father. As the Son is both Lord and God, our opponents blasphemously, blasphemously demonstrate through their redefinition and rejection of the work and covenant in Christ that they are in fact rejecting the Father, proving themselves to be lawbreakers, the very antinomians who resisted Christ and the Holy Spirit all throughout Scripture. As the Apostle John testifies regarding the words of Christ, I and my Father, and in the Greek, we are one, to which the Jews picked up stones to stone him for equating himself with God. Thus, the argument that they are truly being obedient and have true faith through said strict customs of old, they are in fact denying faith and are no different than the whitewashed tombs of the Pharisees. Their father is not the God we serve, but themselves. Thus, they testify the greater reality of grief in Christ Jesus. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. John 6, 28 through 29. Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. All right. Thank you, Noel. That was the spiciest of all the opening statements. Uh, hopefully uh the rest of it's backed up with just as much with just as much rigor because whoo i was like yeah, the comments are going crazy yeah the comments oh yeah the, i'm surprised nuts. you guys i'll be honest i'm surprised y'all have the comments up in the debate because that would <clears throat> distract me hard so with that being said um there is this will be the time that uh we do uh three questions from each side uh each side will ask the opposing side a question and the opposing side will have two to five minutes to respond to that question so as per the usual um the affirmative will go first so um brad and seamus you guys will do your first three questions toward the opposing side absolutely so uh first question right off uh and this one either one of you can take the time to answer uh does the nature of sin change Do you want to take that buck or should I? Go for it. Sure, sure. Uh, the nature of sin in and of itself as um, violating whatever God commands? No, that, that simple statement does not change. The question is, does God's commands change for a particular situation? And we see in Scripture, yes, that it does. For, for example, um, going back all the way to Genesis, uh, Adam was only able to eat plants, as we see in Genesis chapter 2. We then see in Genesis chapter 9, after the flood, that God gives all creatures, every creeping thing, to be food for him. As, and there is no distinction between clean and unclean found, as we see in Genesis chapter 9, verse 3. And second of all, uh, just to give a little bit more context within the Torah, um, Let's see, people were able, were allowed to make sacrificial temples or, or to make temples outside of their homes, as is instructed in Levitic, in Exodus chapter 20, um, verse 24, uh, in order to prepare for the temple. But then once the tabernacle is built, private altars are banned. 
as we see in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 13 through 14, and Joshua chapter 22, verse 29. So we see that as progressive revelation goes, the things that God commands or the things that he does not command change according to a specific purpose. And so the simple fact that sin is transgression of God's law is always in focus. But we do not isolate only one meaning of the term law and then plaster it all over scripture. That's not what we do. Right. So my, my second question would be then, um, just a, a first a correction, uh, clean and unclean actually are specified to Noah. He's actually told to take like one pair, two of unclean animals, and then seven pairs of clean animals. Yes, um, yes, we so we, that I, I do I do acknowledge that, and and as as I actually note, is that it is for sacrifices and not specifically for food. Right. Or so a, so if Noah only took two animals, two pigs, let's just say two pigs, and then mm -hmm. he ate one of them when he got off the ark, where do where how how would we still have pigs today then? Well, the, the obvious question is, did he? And we obviously know he did not because the command is to be fruitful and multiply. So right. okay. the, just, just that, that would basically be an argument from silence, which none of us argue for. Sure, sure. Okay. So uh, with respect to the uh, – I'm, I'm, I understand your position is that the sacrificial system itself ended uh, with the sacrifice of Jesus, correct? Yes. Okay. The so, the admit the administrate the the official sacrificial administration, um, in relation to it being able to be effectual to take away sins. Yes, that ended with Christ. We see that from the veil tearing. That, but the actual sacrificial system did not end until seventy A.D. with the destruction of the temple. Right. Okay. So we're historically. It was just a clarification question. So what do you make of Paul's uh, continuing in the sacrifices in Acts twenty one? Uh, as we as we see in Acts, Acts chapter 21, he basically does this for the sake of the Jews. He does it in order to affirm that, yes, he as a Jew will will participate in some of the customs that the Jews are taking in because this is what they do. But he does not impose it upon the Gentiles as as James himself notes. He says in Acts chapter 21, we know that you are zealous for the law, but. For the Gentiles, we have given them four things to abstain, and that's where it ends. And so he, in, in showing that he is not teaching Jews in order to go against the law, that's not what he's saying, and that's not the position that we take. He actively works in, in fulfilling those traditions. And I would add also in regards to, I mean, consider Acts 20. I mean, Torah observance only has a leg to stand on regarding fellowship and unity amongst Gentile and Jewish relationships, just as one Christian may have a difficulty with another who drinks alcohol in their freedom, while the other feels led to stumble or perceives it as sin, or in our topic's case, paganism or antinomianism. It is it's just a simple matter of one's conscience, not of obedience to the Mosaic law, but obedience to the law of love in Christ Jesus. I quickly want to just interject here. Don't worry, everyone. There will be a discussion period with the contestants, and also there will be a Q&A with the live audience. <laughs> no, sorry, the comments have been going crazy. Now, the next yeah, question uh, now is that were those your three questions that you wanted to ask, Brad? Or Sure, sure, sure. Was that the completion? Okay, Seamus, did you want to add, ask any questions, or do you think that'll suffice for now? Oh, I didn't realize... Um... <clears throat> oh, I thought it was three uh, I, I have, per team. I do have one. Yeah, I thought it was three per team. I realize yeah, I wasn't I clear on that, so I'm just get, I'm allowing grace. So it's okay if we could, we just do three per team then, if that's what was understood. Okay. Okay. Sorry, um, you guys could tell I've been super busy as I've been trying to organize this. So, all right. With that being said, now the negative. You guys have three questions. You guys can ask alter, alternate media. I think I'll take the first one. Sure. Um, and either of you feel free to free to answer this one. Our first question is, what did Christ mean when he said, it is finished? And how does that pertain to our topic? You can go first, Brad. Yeah, that's, that, this is actually a pretty simple one. Um, it is finished is a reference to his mission here on, on earth. Uh, to, to read into that implications of the law 
uh, doesn't really find a basis, not even actually with. Is anybody else losing it? Yeah. Try, try say that again. We, we, yeah, say that again. yeah, say that again. We lost you. And yeah. just, oh, also for the comments, yes, this is being recorded for later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, no, he's, he's referring to his mission here as the suffering servant, right? Because it's understood that there would be two messianic arrivals, even in Christianity, they're currently waiting for the second coming, right? That's, that's the only thing we can really derive here is because the culmination of the, the role of the suffering servant would be that he would die. And this would onset the repentance of Israel and the nations, uh, which would then herald in the conquering King Messiah. To try and tie this to the law in any way, I don't really think finds any kind of a basis, not even contextually. It's it's not relevant to the statement. Yeah, I, I would to add to that. Um, if, if his statement, it is finished, is in reference to the law, then he goes against his own self when he said, I did not come to abolish it. So to say it is finished, is is a synonym with abolished and you're essentially saying that he didn't fit, he didn't abolish it but he kind of abolished it uh and then you run into a theological problem where you have jesus con uh contradicting himself unless the it is finished is his earthly mission and it becomes uh, and, it becomes an argument in semantics yeah basically <laughs> also i like your uh, church split beer glass there brad you guys can get that on our merch store for yeah. super cheap. No um, all right. Now, uh, what's the next question there for you guys? Jeremiah, did you want to respond to that? No, I, I think I think that one is um, is actually made a little bit clear. Uh, could you ask the second question? I okay. have the basis of it in front of me, but I don't have the, the exact references. OK. Do you require circumcision and a trip to Jerusalem in order to keep the feast for those who wish to be obedient, as is laid out in Exodus and Numbers? Which first century definition of circumcision are you asking about? Which one do you think? <laughs> OK, I mean, so I mean, it's, for, it's, it's, it's an important clarification. <laughs> it is. And I can go ahead and clarify as the resident uh, historian for alternate media. There are two different definitions. And typically, so the word circumcision is shorthand in the first century for a full legal ritual conversion to Judaism, uh, in which case, no, absolutely not. Paul, definitely, uh, we, we've already gone over how Sons of Abraham is an idiom for a convert, and you're already considered a convert spiritually. There's, there's no need for the ritual legal circumcision to, to Judaism, so, to legal Judaism. But to answer the question, uh, would we encourage somebody to get a circumcision according to Exodus to go and do the feasts? If there were a temple today... First of all, if you are a Gentile and you do want to go and eat from the Passover lamb, it is, requ it is required that you are a circumcised individual. You're, otherwise, you are not allowed to taste the Passover lamb. That's just the way that the Torah works. And so if one would want to do that, he would have to meet the prerequisite of being circumcised in the flesh, not in the legal conversion matter. Um, but we in, in no way would we uh, encourage people to go and get circumcision done in. in but that's um, what the law obedience. requires. The law, if the law requires that if you want to go to uh, Jerusalem and celebrate that holiday, you can celebrate it anywhere, any, any, anywhere in your but home. But you're supposed your to. Land. Your stance is that you have to adhere to the holidays and feasts and so forth. Am I correct? Yeah. OK. For all believers. Correct. Uh, we would we would uh, adhere. Thus, that like, would mean that they yes, have to be circumcised. It. No. Uh, why would they have to be circumcised? There's no temple. Because that's what it demands. That's what the law requires. The law does the law not require the you law to be circumcised. The law requires. The law, the Exodus says that if someone wants to take the Passover, they must first be circumcised, and then mm -hmm. they may eat of it. Yeah. How, how, how do you how do you come about the Passover lamb being edible? It has to be sacrificed, right? Where did where is it sacrificed? In Jerusalem. At the Temple Mount. At, at, at the Temple at the Temple Mount is yeah. pretty pretty simple answer. It, that that really does that actually really concludes my, uh, concludes the question. If if we're going to properly follow the Mosaic commandment in eating of the Passover lamb, there needs to be a temple and there needs to be priesthoods in order to sacrifice and roast the lamb. So because we do not have those. Why are we attempting to keep the feasts when scripture says 
that it is not a it is not celebrating the feast if we do not have those things. Scripture says that we must not add or take away to those laws. So so how are we trying to to keep the feasts when the critical things in relation to keeping those feasts cannot be done, particularly the location and the actual roasting lamb by a priest? So your 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 question is predicated on the idea that a temple has to be standing in order for you to celebrate a Passover Seder, which, by the way, in a modern Jewish home, there would be no lamb at a Passover Seder, because if there's lamb at the table, it has to be offered at the temple. And since there's no temple with which to make an offering, you can't have lamb. You celebrate the Passover Seder. You just use afikomen, the, the bread, in place of the lamb. Uh, and everything is done symbolically. You're still celebrating. So, but the premise of the question is, I, I, so I would actually, I, I would actually want to press a little bit on that more, because again, if if we're going to make replacements of that, that is, that's not even, that's not even adding or taking away. That's completely changing how oh, no. the Passover is done. Let me no. let me go ahead and cut you off right That's there because exactly this is actually is. predicated on rabbinic tradition that Jesus him, himself accepted, as we see evident at the Last Supper. Why was there no lamb at the Last Supper if we're to understand it was a Passover seder? In fact, because Jesus is the sacrificial lamb. I, I, I of no, course no, no, would, would, no, no. would Jesus is the whether final or not sacrificial lamb. So, so, you are so, proving no, what I said in my this, op opening statement no, I, this, I would, that Jesus is even the then, final I would, sacrifice. And even then, I would first object whether or not there was a lamb there. Because one, scripture doesn't say, so we cannot say whether or not it was or not. Assuming. All right. So then you and you and Noel have something to work out here then, because if he was the sacrificial lamb, then why didn't he hold the lamb shank bone up and say, This is my body broken for you? Why did he use the bread? This is predicated on Because Kiddushin he was the 20. bread that came down during oh. Is is he the bread or is he the dark. is he the lamb? <laughs> He's <laughs> both. So yeah, I would like to answer the, way the, question, the truth yeah. of life. Are you going to try and distinguish himself against himself? Well, as if let you me, let me interject. No Hold on, gentlemen. Uh, I, I, he's also I, a lion. Does that, is uh, he not a lion and a lamb at the same time? He's God. One second. So uh, this will be get, you guys can beat each other up here in about 30 seconds. This is a three question time. And I let you all kind of go over time there because I was actually <laughs> interested in what was happening. But uh, we, I do have one more question that the, I believe that you guys have to ask, correct? There's yes. a third one there, Noel Four. Okay, could you ask that, and then we'll uh, get to cross-examination well, discussion. Yeah, I mean, it, it was just a simple question, and we got a, we got into it a little bit in your opening statement, Seamus. But how would you exegete Acts chapter 15? Okay, uh, so I actually have it already open. Funny enough, um, it's one of my other questions. You you made the claim that nowhere does James uh, assert that Torah observance is the goal of the four prohibitions. To which I would point to you in Acts chapter 15, in verse, um, uh, they, they, so the first, uh, where's, where is it, where the four prohibitions are. The four prohibitions are mentioned, and then verse in Acts 20. 15, chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 21, for Moses from ancient generations has had in every city those who proclaim him, since he is read in all the synagogues every Shabbat. That is the concluding statement James makes after listing the four prohibitions. So I would exegete this way. Uh, Acts 15, the first paragraph tells us the context. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That is the claim. The claim is iner inherently false because the circumcision here is shorthand for legal conversion to Judaism. And they are saying you need to legally convert to be saved. Obviously, these Gentiles are already saved. They've received the Holy Spirit, and they have not been circumcised. So what do we need for them to do? Because they're not yet Torah observant, but they are still basically short of idolaters. They are prohibited from engaging in idolatrous practices so that they can go into the synagogue. You are not allowed inside of a synagogue if you're tainted with idolatry. So that they can go into the synagogue where James concludes, because Moses has been preached since every generation, in every single city, in every single synagogue, every single Sabbath day. That's the concluding statement from that. And then they write the letter and they send the letter. And they send the letter with a lawyer, I believe, uh, to help explain what they mean by the letter. Okay. Now that we have that context, and I, I saw a comment and they're going, hosts, let them debate. 
I am. <laughs> I, I want to address the fact that we had an agreed upon structure. The structure was uh, strategized this way for a reason. It was because I want everyone to have the proper context. I want them to hear everyone's position on main three questions, because those three questions are important and they're going to play major roles in the discussion time. So I want everyone to properly be able to represent their views and understand each other's views so we can properly speak to one another during our open discussion period, which begins now. So if there's anything you want to address, now's the time. Is, is there, are we like taking turns or is it just sort of like whoever turns first? Well, I think we Fire should away, baby. <laughs> Jeremiah, if you'd like to. Yeah, I, I honestly think we should basically continuing where we left off in Acts chapter 15. I would yeah. ask, what, what is your position on the, the, the group found in Acts chapter 15, verse five, where it says that these are believers who are of, um, who are basically of the Pharisees and say that it is necessary for them to be circumcised and to observe the law of Moses. And it, it, it does not say for, uh, for salvation because these are already, these are already believers. So in, in your, in your first comments about it, these people are completely not addressed. Do you believe that these are two different people, two different groups, or are they the same group? What would you make of these people? So this is a council that's gathered together of believers from everybody in Israel at the time who is a believing follower of Yeshua. Many of them would have been Pharisees, as he himself was a Pharisee. Uh, but the really, this discussion begins uh, further ahead in Acts chapter 13. That's the whole, it's to build the whole basis for this. Um, Gentiles are already meeting in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Uh, it's an important thing to note at this time. That's where everybody's meeting at this point. Um, the uh, the uh, invented shift to Sunday in the New Testament hasn't occurred yet, so to speak, at this point. Uh, so there's a problem here, though, as to what to do with these Gentiles who are now coming into the Jewish community, because a lot of them are not maintaining the same standard of holiness that the Jews themselves hold themselves to. And there is actually a standard of holiness that has to be met. And so what James gives us is essentially a compromise simply for Gentiles to be allowed in the synagogue where they can learn Torah. Because again, James' statement is predicated on the presupposition that they were already going to be learning Torah. I would propose that that is an entire theology, an entire assumption that is inserted into Acts chapter 15, verse 21. Would you would you like to see my exegesis of this particular passage? Sure. Sure. Well, like, yeah. like we said, I, I, would, I would propose that these are two completely different groups. The first group in Acts chapter 15, verse 1 says that you must be circumcised in order to be saved as as. Uh, as you guys have noted, but the second is is quite quite extensive because we see here in in these people from the Pharisees they note explicitly that we must command them these these Jew, these Gentiles to observe uh, the law of Moses and be circumcised and then the debate happens and and and. Peter basically says, guys, you, you know from the beginning that the Gentiles heard the gospel from my mouth and they didn't need to convert. Therefore, why are you tempting God and putting on them a weight that we could not bear, that either we nor our fathers were unable to bear? So, so the question is, you're, 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 you asserted in your opening statement that this particular burden is, is conversion, but those who were born in the um, born in the covenant did not have to engage in conversion. They had to be physically circumcised and they had to obey the law of Moses from uh, not, not even all of it from birth. They learned it as they got older. So what, what, what is the burden? Observing the law, observing the law of Moses and the customs. No, and no, we see, no. So, no. so, so <laughs> what, so what would you know. propose? What was the be? burden then? What would, you, the burden? what would you propose the burden be? Okay, so let me explain to you guys the conversion process in the hold, first hold, 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 Before you get to that, Seamus, let me, let me go ahead and take this one. Okay. Uh, first of all, the notion that the law is too hard to do is uniquely Christian. doesn't exist in Jewish teaching of the first century or any time afterward. Um, matter of fact, the New Testament actually contradicts this in Luke 1.5 by specifically naming two people who were perfect according to the law. 
being John the Baptist's parents. The definition of profession Again, is something uh, other than what scripture lays out. We've no, already established it this. specifically profession says does the law. not mean sinlessness. It okay. If the law defines sin and they're perfect according to the law, this has inherent implications. Okay. Now, beyond that point, okay. Uh, we're we're presupposing a theological position that doesn't exist in Judaism at the time, right? This is this kind of eisegesis just doesn't flow with the history of the text. Now, considering the idea of conversion literally overnight, where now you are going to have the whole of the law applied to you overnight with no time at all to actually uh, learn it and grow in it, that's a burden that no Jew has ever had to bear. Now, I would like to, um, real quickly, the so the law process only is it, partial. You get to pick you know, and so choose essentially as, what as laws. As Brad you said, can... here's here's the thing about Jewish uh, not fully. Um, literature. It all applies. You can't just pick and what, choose. What 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 law did I pick Hold and on. choose? All laws pick and you just picked and choose in regards yeah. to what people have to follow by saying and admitting that they are sin that they are not sinless that they are in fact imperfect. Who, you? Just now. No, no, no. Who, who, who? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a little lost on who you're referring to. Like, like, you mean like John's parents. I think he's talking about John's yeah, John, parents. Like John's parents. Has anybody been able to fulfill the law perfectly except Christ? No. But that is to say, on the outside, a person, a person is declared righteous by their observance in the first century, and they appear to be in perfect observance and sinless that doesn't mean they are sinless but that they give the appearance of sinlessness in their actions and such a person is usually called perfect james the righteous the brother of jesus was so called because his torah observance was so was so if uh, perfection so could good. be attained by the law though why did we need christ now per perfection the first of all the law never claims to be able to give you perfection you just argue and the law that, never though. claimed to save you that's another thing that we get a lot of you just um, argued though no, the law never I, I, claimed I to think, be salvation. I think the I think the misconception here is the presupposition that somebody who has uh, been demonstrated to observe the law perfectly has has never once in their life broken it before. Okay, uh, there there's a difference between having sinned and ceasing to sin. So. Deuteronomy so, thirty eleven. So to be so to be righteous in all of your ways is to have repented of your sins and then have not sinned afterwards is to live a righteous a righteous life uh, as so, we would so say, would in say a, yeah. so you're so you're asserting that that that, that John's parents had sinned but ever since that they have repented and have not sinned again since then no, I clarified on the outside, they give the appearance of sinlessness in their observance. Their observance is so perfect. They are blameless before God and before men. They're so so it's in, so the, the phrase of righteous is in relation to comparing one sinner to another and not in the way that we have actually been talking about as in right standing yeah. before God. The, the standard of righteousness is comparing the sinner to the Torah itself. That's the standard that's given. And but the to, standard to of righteousness the for the question. Torah is sinlessness and, and being comparing with God because the, the Torah says, be holy as I am holy, be perfect as I am perfect, as Jesus says. Yeah, so, right. so to be perfect is to be sinless. To be perfect is to, okay, so when Jesus said be perfect as I am perfect, are you saying to that to achieve, are you saying that you can achieve the same perfection that Jesus had? Because of what no. Christ has done? Yes. If being not, impugned not in, to you is different from your obedience, right? You're you were impugned with righteousness because of the work of Christ, making you just before God on the day of judgment. But your actions here are still dictated by the things that you do. So, are you saying when Jesus said, "Be perfect as I am perfect," that what you would concede that this means to be obedient to Him in some way, shape, form, or fashion? Are you saying it's perfect? It's 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 perfectly reasonable to uh, to attain perfection. The way Jesus said that you could be through him, there is a calling to remain. Uh, there is a calling to be perfect, but as right. Paul, but as Paul says over and over again, we are being, we are continually being made perfect. 
And that 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 perfection is only a, obtained at death when when our 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 bodies are fully mortified, our spirits are fully cleansed by the spirit, and then we await resurrection. So that calling to be perfect is not a command saying do this and you actually will. It is a call by which we strive towards because we strive to be like Christ as he is. And we are we are we are grafted from glory to glory, but we will never achieve that here in this life because yeah, we are we still in our sinful flesh. There, there we but, agree. But, but you said that 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 John's parents were righteous in that sense because that, the no, no, no. I, the I, I, I don't say that. Luke says that. that. Luke like, says that. Your Luke, problem right. is with how Luke characterized John's parents. I'm at, I'm asking you. I'm my problem is not with Luke. My problem is with your interpretation of Luke. There's a big difference, which so has a massive theological problem. Perfect. Yeah. What 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 does it mean to be righteous according to the law? As by in Luke's faith. words, by faith in the one who was to come, the law Christ. Says, what 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 what, what does what does faith have to do with the law? Like like what what. Well, where's the connection that the you're making there? The law is a schoolmaster, a tutor, how, as Galatians clearly says, and points how, us to the Christ you know, that we could right, not right, be perfect. But, but how but does how does what Christ how does has faith, done? We have how does and especially this is before Jesus died. This is right. What you how does faith at this point make you righteous according to the law? And in Luke's words, prior to Jesus dying at this point, because the perfection three. of Christ, Romans his final three. sacrifice is imputed to you. It's not about perfection in being meticulous Again, in those customs. Prior this is to what his I tried death. to complain. This is what I tried to convey in my opening statement very clearly. No one is perfect. No one is good. No, not one except God alone. And because of what Christ has done on the cross, his perfection, sinlessness is imputed to you. You cannot be perfect. You cannot keep the law unless you want to go through every single one of those laws and tell me you've kept them perfectly. This, this, I don't I, think you I, can I, pass that test. The example given is prior to his death. A matter of fact, is prior to even his conception at this point. So what? Christ is eternal. Christ is eternal. You deny the divinity of Christ, that Christ is preexistent. You deny that Christ is eternal. We don't. That I makes would, you was, heretics and proves what we are we trying to convey. We left the, the, the context of what we were talking about. Because yeah, we went from Acts chapter 15 and then we went to Luke chapter Luke okay. chapter 1. Let, well, let's let's, look at let's go stuff. back to, to, yeah, let's, to Acts chapter 15. Yeah. Let's reel so, things in a little bit here. Uh, also, uh, just as for the audience's sake, uh, let's try not to speak over each other, let people finish each other's statements because when we keep cutting each other off, it's going to make audio difficult for everyone to listen. So let's try to, right. try to let people finish statements. Let, let, let's go back to the, uh, the four regulations that were given um, by, by James. How, how would you categorize these particular, uh, particular uh, regulations? So for, for context sake, because we, we were getting into this and then we got, we got moved on. Uh, naturally, but, uh, we, we were talking about the yoke and you'd asked me the question, what is the yoke that Peter is talking about here in, and I was going to say in Jewish literature, the Torah is never referred to as a yoke. And it's primarily based on the verse of Deuteronomy 30 verse uh, 11 for this commandment that I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you or nor is it far off from you. So, in Jewish literature, instead, the word yoke is usually used in the form of a halakha, or it's the Hebrew word for walk. And it usually is a, a legal term to refer to judgments made by the Sanhedrin. Anytime a Sanhedrin would make a ruling on a particular commandment, it would become halakha, or uh, a legal uh, rendering. And that was considered a yoke because there's always different ways to interpret um, halakha. An example would be... Uh, on uh, Sabbath, you can uh, there's there's a law that you have to light a candle before the Sabbath begins. That way, you make a separation for the day. Um, that is a form of halakha. A a strict interpretation would be do it an hour before Sabbath begins. A loose interpretation would be do it 18 minutes before the Sabbath begins. So these are binding and loosenings of the of the halakha, and which one you pick is a yoke. So when when Jesus says my yoke is not a burden, my yoke is light. He is specifically saying the way that I teach Torah 
is in a looser sense, which is more in line with uh, the Pharisees. Hillel, he did the same thing. Rabban Gamliel, Paul's rabbi, did the same thing. And so back to Acts 15, they are taking a loose, uh, a loose, more lenient position on what should a Gentile be uh, required to do before he's allowed to set foot in a synagogue where normally under, under regular Jewish halakha, a, Je a Jew and a Gentile cannot associate at all. Peter made a uh, very clear reference to this in Acts chapter 10 when he, vis when he visits Cornelius. So now we have a problem. Jewish law says they can't intermingle, but Gentiles are saved. So how do we get them in the synagogue? What is the minimum requirement so that we can say that they're not idolaters and be welcome into the synagogue? They take a lenient approach. They get four, uh, they get four particular prohibitions to abstain from idolatry. Basically, all four of them have something to do with idolatry in some way. And then they will be expected to learn over time the halakha of the master, Yeshua, as James again says, because Moses has been preached in every generation, every city, every Sabbath, every synagogue. I would, I would, I would graciously object to that because uh, first, first and foremost, um, let's see, there, there are a few things. One, these, as I, as I was asking about these specific four requirements, their relation to um, of course, related to idolatry. Is that correct? Yes. So wh how, how would you clarify these particular laws? Are they basically the beginning of a Torah starter pack in order to get them into the synagogue? Yeah. But why in Acts chapter 13, um, Acts chapter 13, verse 48, when he is speaking to uh, Jews and Gentiles in the synagogue, which is basically the, the main city uh place of, of place of commerce and learning of the Torah in that sense. And the Jews are, are up in arms about him, about him preaching. He says, okay, it, because you discard the word, we are going to the Gentiles and the Gentiles are, are, are grafted in. They say those who are appointed to eternal, eternal life believed. And from that, we don't hear about them going into the synagogues anymore. If anything, they went back uh, into the, the basic tradition of the early church in, in house churches. We don't hear them in synagogues aside from those who are ethnic Jews. So, so, so again, how would, how, would this how would these requirements basically be a, a Torah starter pack if, if the Jew and, and your assertion that James is saying that these people are coming into the synagogues when since Acts chapter 13, which is, of course, years before, um, years before Acts chapter 15, they were not going there. I mean, that, that is, I would say in, within the text, there is a difference between the, the, the ethnic Jews, the God fears, the Gentiles who were curious about Torah and and went into uh, the synagogue and those who were just Gentiles without going into the synagogue. How would these um how would these requirements help those who were not in the synagogue? There, there, there's a fundamental presupposition here that they weren't in the synagogue. We really don't see a, a uh, diversion or an exodus from the synagogue culture until much later in church history, uh, about the same time that we generally don't see a diversion from Sabbath observance uh, until much later in church history. Uh, we're talking pretty late second century, early third century that we're starting to see this stuff. Um, more or less, I, I historically would, where, where would, you find would completely object to that. Uh, that, that, that's fine. You're, you're, you're more than welcome to disagree with what history well, has you, established you, on this. No, 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 no. I, no I, I, was going, I was going can to you, object by actually referring to historical sources. Would that, you like that, me that, to do that? That's fine. Sure, sure. We, we, we can go there. Sure. So, so let me actually read from one of the sources that I've been looking at and one of the ones that I've been priding so much. Um, uh, Christianity at the Crossroads by Michael Kruger, one of the main scholars in second century, early second century uh, uh, Christianity. He says in relation to the, um, in relation to worship in the second century, primarily the place of worship, um, but the formal worship of Christian communities quickly coalesced around Sunday, also known as the Lord's Day. The first day of the week was the day Christians gathered to break bread, Acts 20, verse 7, collecting offerings for those in need, 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 2, and engaged in spiritual activity, Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. 
No doubt the practice of a weekly meeting followed the Jewish practice of setting one day in seven, Genesis chapter two, verse three, and Exodus 20, verse eight, which we, especially me as a Presbyterian, would understand the pattern of that because it's established in Genesis. Although Christians focused on the first day of the week, since that was the day that Christ had risen from the dead. And he notes in citing um, uh, Dr. Coleman's early Christian worship, and I can even refer to uh, the early church references themselves in relation to the Didache, which says on the Lord's own day uh, to bring your sacrifices and fast so that your sacrifice may be pure. What is the sacrifice? The Eucharist, as we actually see if you uh, continue reading the passage. Pliny the Younger, and uh, who was a ruler between uh, 111 and 113 AD, notes that Christians were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsibly a hymn to Christ as to God. And um, let's see, Justin Martyr, who lived from 100 to 165, notes that on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together in one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. And then when the reading has ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts those um, to the imitation of these good things. And finally, um, Ignatius, one of the first followers of Jesus, the apostolic fathers, a student of Polycarp and the apostle John on in, in around uh, 110 AD, as he Allegedly. is going to his martyrdom, says, quote, for if we still go on observing Judaism, we admit we never received grace. The divine prophets themselves live Christ Jesus's way. This is why they were persecuted, for they were inspired by his grace to convince unbelievers that God is one and that he has revealed himself in the son, Jesus Christ. Skipping down, those, hen those then who lived by ancient practices arrived at a new hope. They ceased to keep the Sabbath and lived by the Lord's day on which our life as well as theirs shone forth, thanks to him and his death, though some deny this. So, so we see the first few years of the early church after the apostles, this, this Sunday service and, and the non-abstaining from Jewish practices, as I can quote the epistle of Diognetus, uh, the epistle of Barnabas, um, Novation, all of, the other, all of the other early church fathers, they are unanimous on this issue. So, right. so to so, say that, that, that history does not have this is, is, is just categorically an error. So, all right. To say that and history it, does not have this is category an er error. Okay, fine. Um, do you understand how a Hebrew day operates? Uh, evening and morning. Okay, so the day begins in the evening when the sun goes down. Now, are you aware of what a Musaf Shabbat is? Essentially, not extensively. However, Except, the historians who would be addressing this issue would have, and they still hold this point. Well, I, I doubt that the historian that you were reading from in that first book knows what a Hebrew day is because he asserted Michael that Kruger? he was on the morning of the first day. Understand, Michael, that, Michael Kruger doesn't doesn't know. One of the top historians in relation Listen. to not only first and second <laughs> history, but the canon of scripture in relation to both the Old Testament and the New Testament, they don't know. Allow me to finish. Uh, he clearly doesn't if he quoted Acts uh, 20, verse 7. The words, what's being used there, that is the equivalent in Greek of Musaf Shabbat, which means that they were meeting Saturday night as the Sunday was beginning, which is common right. in Judaism, ancient Judaism to this day even. At the end of the Sabbath, you meet, you have Havdalah, which is a service that separates the Sabbath from the rest of the days, and you give a lesson. And here's the, here's the key verse that, that lets you in that Acts 20 is talking about a Musaf Shabbat, the end of the Sabbath, because they collect money for tithing or, or for offerings. The thing is, you cannot handle money on a Sabbath day. So the only time you would normally give your offerings or your tithing would be at Musaf Shabbat after the Sabbath has ended. Then you can handle and trade with money which is why it's perfect and prime. They would gather to break bread. Again, this is part of Jewish history, Jewish uh, traditions in the first century to do this on a Saturday night. Yes, it is technically the first day, but they are not, uh, they are not abstaining from Sabbath day by moving it to Sunday. They are in fact keeping the Sabbath day and they are meeting as soon as the Sabbath day ends in order to do everything else that they're supposed to be doing. You and also mentioned the Didache. A, as, you said the Didache a, yeah. has the day of the Lord bringing uh, the gathering of together. 
first of all, the that's not what it says in the Greek. It's actually very ambigu ambiguous. Um, Sir, essentially, it, it, it is says not ambiguous. That, it's not no, ambiguous. it is very ambiguous. It says Kurikan de Curio, which is redundant. It says Lord's Day of the Lord, which sort of doesn't really make sense. And scholars it, have it, it debated for a long Lord's time. Own day. Scholars have debated for a the long Lord's time because this day. is not like the anytime you see in Greek the Day of the Lord, it's not written this way. It's written in a different way entirely. So scholars have debated that this does not mean Sunday, and it can't be the first reference to meeting on Sunday because of its redundancy. It's most likely a scribal error. And this also does not mean it's not <laughs> Sabbath day related because the day of the Lord, if you read the Bible, let's say you read just a Torah scroll or even Isaiah for that matter, the day of the Lord is either the judgment day at the end of days or the Sabbath day. It's not until the second century the church fathers invent that the day of the Lord moves to Sunday invent. in the first the guys century, that walked with the apostles and walked with Jesus himself. And okay. so the people so around, they were just, they were just, no, 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 they were no, just, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. You brought up foremost, Polycarp and day. Okay. So you, hold on. Who was let's, the disciple actually, that said let's, actually deal with that, let's actually deal with that first assertion. Nobody is saying that the, that the same day as Sunday is the exact same way that the old pro that the Old Testament prophets use the day of the Lord. Nobody's asserting that. Yeah. However, all, his, all all credible historians note that that the Lord's Day in in patristic senses and as many have argued in the uh, in the New Testament is in relation to Sunday. So you disagree with E. P. Sanders's work. You also disagree with Michael Kaiser's work all of them legitimate historians that refute the very historians you're quoting now. Are they, I are they, 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 I wouldn't say that they refute them. They absolutely I wouldn't say that they refute them. them. I would even, I would, and I'm not totally familiar uh, with Bart he, Ehrman's work and all of his, and everything, but I, Bart, I would even and, and Bart, Bart Ehrman's, Bart Ehrman also notes that if, if I am, if I am uh, correct, and I don't think that I'm mistaken, he would affirm the same thing. No. Now, Captain the Dadpool's century, in the you... chat. Correct that if it's untrue. What? <laughs> Captain what? Dadpool's in the chat. If if anybody oh. has a, a Bart Ehrman I mean, quote, it's going to be him. <laughs> and here's the thing, too. I, I think this is an emphasis that you're making in regards to the flesh. Again, demonstrating that you're trying to go back to the Old Testament law and the Old Testament burdens when Jesus is the Sabbath. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. The so, so Matthew, okay, he is our rest. Matthew 5, 17... Matthew 5, 17 through 19. Do not think that I came to abolish the law. I did not come to abolish the law. He mentions this twice so that it is yeah. doubly let's, let's understood act, what he's just Let's, put it, let's yeah, put it in context. Let's put it in context. He continues on to say that those who don't do the law and teach others not to do it will be least in the kingdom. So they'll still be in the kingdom. There's no argument there, but they'll be least. And then he goes on to say that your righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. First of all, noting that the Pharisees are righteous, right? This idea that they're not, Jesus himself the calls them righteous, righteous in this verse. They're not verse. whitewashed tombs. He, I, I, he clearly here, he says that they are righteous. Oh Let, let's actually question. start at the beginning of Matthew chapter 15, verse 17. Um, Do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy or to abolish, but to fulfill. So, so... It, how would you determine the phrase law and the prophets? Do you think that's just in relation to the Torah, the 613 minutes vote? So it's actually noteworthy that the prophets is a later addition to newer manuscripts. Older manuscripts just say the law. However, to answer your question, because whether or not the prophets is added doesn't make a difference, because the whole point of the prophets was to preach to the children of Israel and tell them repent, which is teshuva in Hebrew, means to turn back. What had Israel strayed away from to which they needed to return Faith. at this point? What are the prophets Christ, telling them to return to? was to come. To the Torah. You can't return to something that hasn't come yet, Buck. <laughs> it's almost as um, if <laughs> Jesus is preexistent, eternal, a as he is God. Actually, actually. And to, the promise say, of Abraham. To actually say that Matthew 5, uh, Matthew five seventeen, the phrase and the prophets is a textual variant, I can't find that in Bruce Metzger's textual commentary. It's not even a textual variant in, um, in, my, uh, in my Greek New Testament. It, it, it's just. It's not there. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I'm not there, aware there's of no the textual variant either, either. But uh, that's really, it really is neither here nor there. Even in Talmudic literature, the law and the prophets are often roped together. And even there are times where 
I'm trying to think of a quote off the bat where the Midrash says, so says the law, and it quotes from Proverbs. Um, exactly. That, that's, 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 my, that's my entire point. That's really my entire point. We can't regulate the law to merely the 613 minutes vote of Moses. What the passage is talking about is that he did not come to destroy the law and the prophets. It's referring to the entire Old Testament. This is what the Jews usually did when they grouped two things together, the law and the prophets. And then Jesus goes on to say um, that I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. The term fulfill is plerosi. And uh, R.T. France analyzes three possible contextual meanings to the term plerosi. It could mean to obey, which doesn't fit because the term abolish specifically means in relation to teaching, as we see later on. Uh, the second one is to bring out its full meaning, which is, of course, true what Jesus will do in verse 21, but it doesn't fit Matthew's usage of fulfill in his gospel, such as in Matthew 3.15, Matthew 26, 54 and 56, Luke 1, 22, etc. It's usually in reference to the fulfilling of the Old Testament, uh, Old Testament prophecy and things spoken of, uh, of spoken of him. But the C, meaning to complete or to bring to its intended end, fits best here, as he notes. There is actually a Jewish expectation that he knows that the Messiah will definitively explain the law, amounting virtually to a promulgation of a new law. Not saying that it is a new law, but it's something very similar to it, virtually. So Jesus actually brings the fullness of what the Old Testament looked for, and his teaching doesn't go against the Old Testament, but is its culmination. And as we see, in, as he continues to go on, he takes the things that were falsely said about the law, but takes, it, takes the actual claims of the law to its full meaning in order to say, sure, you might think that the Pharisees are righteous, but you must exceed them to belong in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is actually taking his authority and bringing it higher than they would even expect because the Jews tried to go through the letter of the law, which of course they might seem righteous, but Jesus takes it to its heart, what the law is actually trying to say. And, and that, that goes across, you know, multiple other things. Right. But in doing so, he does not set aside the letter. He does not say, you don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore. He's saying, you need to well, keep that's, the Sabbath. That's not the, it, that's not the context. Right. Well, that, the, 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 so the, the, the context as you've it. isogeted doesn't really work here. So let's no, go back to the word play recite He just here. read it in context. And he, you were he, 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 he didn't. It. He actually quoted somebody else who is uh, hinging very hard on the passive uh, context of plerusai, which is not used in which this not passage. In the passage. It's actually the active, the active tense. It's the uh, aorist for, active for, tense. Furthermore, for, well, it's, it's, it's the active tense, yes. Aorist active. Aorist well, active. But the passive of this so phrase would be to be filled the, or to make full. So, But, but well, he, so, he doesn't so, so, take so, that to, interpretation. To, to, right. Finished. No, the, the passive actually would be would be better set towards a bringing to an end. Uh, to, so, to make so full, do you disagree to, to, with Mounts when it defines it as that? Excuse you me. Mean, do do you do you disagree with Gregory Mounts when he defines the passive form of that to be filled? To sure. mean to That's, be filled. I'm 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 fine with that. Uh, I really, but it's I'm not in the passive on, form. So I'm why does it matter? To, right. I'm I'm trying to get on a little closer here. When and actually, yeah, if we're talking about prophetic fulfillment, why wouldn't we use the passive form here? Uh, but better yet, contextually, if we're going to juxtapose this to elsewhere in Torah where we see, or in the rest of Scripture, where we see similar uh, similar contrasts, uh, Numbers 30, 14, because let's not forget, Jesus didn't speak Greek, so arguing the Greek word is almost irrelevant. I would here. disagree. Uh, I, would, well, I would highly disagree with that. <laughs> that's, Christ, mostly, Christ probably, as a first century Jew, would have had to speak at least two languages. One, because he's a rabbi, he would have, well, one, because he's a Jew at the time, he would have to speak Aramaic. Uh, because he's a rabbi, he would have to learn how to read the Torah, so he would be, um, he would have to read Hebrew. Um, he was, he was living in a Hellenized group, uh, so he would have to converse with mm. other uh, others who, who would have um, known the language of commerce or the language Franca at the time, which is Greek. And of course he was under the occupation of Rome. So he possibly could have spoken Latin. So if, to, to if, say if, that he only spoke one 
is is to to basically take him out of his historical context. Well, no, to suppose that he taught in Greek is to take him out of his historical context. Uh, Jewish teaching was such that they only ever taught in Hebrew. And well, okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, I know, I know. You guys are flying, and I feel like this discussion could last another three hours. I'm just pointing <laughs> out that we are kind of going a little bit in circles, a little bit on certain points. So, uh, which is fine. Eventually, all debates hit that. But also, just for the sake of brevity, because I do know I we are getting, dude. The chat is on fire right now. I've just been kind of making fun of it and laughing over here. Some of you guys like your caps lock too much. Um, so, uh, but my thing is, I think it'd be great if we did our closing statements and then open it up for Q and A from the audience. Sure. Because I think that's where we can also get in a little bit more nitty gritty. Um, and so let's do that. Is that okay with you guys? Are you cool with us moving on? Or Brad, did you want to finish your thought real fast? If I can finish it just ever, ever so ahead. quickly. Yeah, right? no, no. Uh, I, uh, absolutely. I cut it, you off, it, so you're and fine. Then we'll give Jeremiah in, in, a chance in, to in, in Numbers 30, 30, 14, what we see is a scenario where a wife can make a vow to God, right? But because she's under the headship of her husband, he can either confirm or deny that vow. So he can either he can either establish it or he can void it. This is the exact same juxtaposition that we're seeing Yeshua make here. And so it's more than likely he used yeah. these Hebrew words. If you don't like that example, we can skip to another. Uh, and the Septuagint itself would actually support this. In 1 Kings 1.14, uh, the prophet is telling the queen to go and relay her words to the king and that he would then come in afterwards and plerusai, that is to give strength to embolden her words. So if we want, if we want to give, if we want to make a hang up of the Greek language, I can play that game too. Um, and and it still works to the to the to the the effect of not ending the Torah, but rather strengthening it to embolden it to give it more weight. So there's no change of the law with a change of the priesthood. No, I, I well, well, I think that question will come later. But it, in order for me to respond to that, I would, I would lean the context of this particular word to the way that it's used in the context of Matthew. Matthew defines what we mean by the use of pleurosi to complete or finish, and I believe that he is quite clear in his statements. That's a presupposition. Uh, I have uh, literally he, given you the context of Matthew predicated on other just comparative verses. We're just gonna. Yeah, I'm just going to let that one hang. I, I had a comment here. Will finally moderate it. Hey, I told them they get open discussion. I was like, y'all take it for a while. I'll literally let them steer the ship. Um, one of the big, one, to me in a debate, I think opening statements and clarifying questions at the beginning always helps me understand what the pe people's opposing positions are. But one of the most frustrating things I'll have in any debate is if there's not open discussion period. If I do not have an open discussion period where the contestants are just allowed to have at it, I get frustrated. Uh, there's been quite a few debates I've highly anticipated. They didn't have that opportunity um, because I think that's where you start seeing a lot of the strengths and weaknesses in the uh, opposing positions. Does that make sense? So for the audience, if for someone like myself who listens to hours of debates, I don't listen to music anymore, really. Sadly, I listen to debates. There's a reason why we have it structured this way. I think it's just for possible, for the best possible engagement on all opposing sides. So with that being said, we are doing closing statements. Now, uh, those, of course, we know that alternate media opened this debate, taking the affirmative, which means uh, per traditional format, uh, they uh, get to do their closing statement now. And then the Protestants here get to do the last word. So Brad, do you get the first 10 minutes, uh, the 10 minute closing statement? Absolutely. All right, your time begins when you speak. All right. So, in closing, <clears throat> I believe me and my compatriot have adequately proven that our position was the majority position in the first century synagogue. We would like to remind our opponents and the viewers that Christianity as a separate religion did not exist in the days of the apostles. The apostles never imagined a world in which their faith would be considered separate from the Jewish community. Paul and the other apostles lived and died as Torah-keeping Jews. It is not till much later, after the destruction of the temple, and especially after the Bar Kokhba revolt, that Christianity becomes severed from the Jewish tree root. And now, without the guidance of any Jewish leadership, the blind lead the blind into a pit they both fell into. The early church fathers 
in their anti-Semitism, did everything in their power to rid their communities of any trace of Judaism, and so implemented many changes to the faith in order to do so. Among many other things, Torah practice was eventually outlawed by the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Antioch, and the Council of Laodicea. Even so, regardless of these changes, the Church Fathers baselessly forced onto the scripturally ignorant a community of Torah-keeping Christians always remained uh, Eusebius, late 4th century CE, recorded they existed in two forms. Proving this movement we call Messianic Judaism is nothing new. Even Martin Luther, after giving the common person the ability to read the Bible in his own language, had to put much effort into ending Torah observance by writing two books. Because, as it turns out, when you read the Bible without theological manipulation, believers will return to Torah on their own. We propose that the modern reading of the New Testament is mostly eisegesis. But more than that, the modern reader, having zero familiarity with cultural Judaism and the context therein, is misreading much of the scripture. They don't do it on purpose, but you don't know what you don't know, and you don't know that you don't know it till you're made aware. We must keep in mind that the Bible was not written for 21st century CE modern Christians. It is an entirely Jewish document written by Jews to congregations of Jews and Gentiles within the Jewish context. The apostles were within a sect of Judaism, and the Gentile converts were being accepted into Judaism uh, as a sect of Judaism, a sect of Judaism that only differed from the rest of Judaism in that the conversion process for this particular sect was so lenient that anybody could, do, could uh, join at the drop of a hat. This sect of Judaism was known as The Way. Some Christians know this title, uh, but what most do not know is that the way, Hadarech in Hebrew, is an idiom for Torah. The Talmud makes multiple references to the Torah being known as the way, based on scripture like Psalm 119.30, Proverbs 6.23, and Proverbs 15.24, where the Torah is clearly called the way. It was, and still is, common to refer to somebody who is no longer living the faith life as one who has fallen off the way, or off the derech. Yeshua is the way, so we should walk in the way he walked. This is Torah. We must remember that for the first hundred years of the existence of Christianity, it was virtually indistinguishable from Judaism, and that the whole point for Gentile inclusion uh, inclusion into Judaism, the covenant and the promises. Uh, Seamus, you wrote this weird. Yeah, promises plural. <laughs> yeah, I, promises I plural. Evening. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. You read the rest. <laughs> All right. Then the whole point was for Gentile inclusion, inclusion into Judaism, the covenants and the promises, promises plural. The book of Hebrews makes it clear that no covenant replaces another, but rather they build on each other. Our opponent's position is that their version of the new covenant has replaced many of the other promises. This, my friends, makes God a liar when he said these covenants are in establishment forever. They do not get replaced by the new covenant. The new covenant only builds upon the foundation of covenants previously established. Among those covenants is the Torah. We as Christians should be careful to obey the teachings of our master Yeshua. He warned that some who claim to be his will do many convincing things in his name. They can cast out demons and perform miracles in his name. And yet, rather ominously, Yeshua said to them, depart from me. I never knew you, you lawless ones. I would propose that likely in either Hebrew or in Aramaic, Jesus had said something like, depart from me, you Torahless ones. A very scary saying of the master we should take seriously. And I would also like to point out that although Paul is very much misunderstood by the modern lay reader, as Peter rightly predicted would happen, and we would propose that he didn't actually teach against Torah observance, nevertheless, from reading only the Gospels, one would never come to the conclusion of Torahlessness without appealing to a, mis a misinterpretation of Paul. This fact alone should raise an eyebrow. Remove all of Paul's letters from our opponent's argument, and what you are left with is basically nothing. You cannot make the case of the abolition of Torah in the entire Bible without a misapplication of Paul. While our opponents would argue it's inappropriate to elevate the words of Jesus over the words of Paul, we do f in fact find precedence for this in Scripture, Numbers 12, uh, 1 through 8, we find that Miriam, the sister of Moses, a prophetess, asserting her own word and prophecy to be equal to Moses, and she is promptly corrected by God himself when he explains that he did not speak to Moses as the other prophets, that he and Moses spoke face to face. 
Deuteronomy 1815 reminds us that the Messiah would be a prophet like Moses. And thus, there is most certainly a valid and biblical precedence to revere the words of Yeshua above and before those of Paul, should they contradict one another. Lastly, we would again like to stress that we do not teach or believe in a works-based salvation. We simply teach obedience to the Messiah Yeshua is the goal. There is and always has been an expectation of covenant obedience alongside salvation through grace by faith. Even the reformers taught this. Just read the 1689 Baptist Confessions. They even state that Christians should keep the Sabbath and rest on it. Albeit, they say that they changed the Sabbath to Sunday, but at least they admitted that they changed it and not God or Christ. Love is the fulfillment of the Torah. To this we agree. Love is not the replacement of the Torah. Love is the motivation necessary to fulfill Torah commandments. Just like faith without works is dead, so too works without faith is equally dead. And you can easily replace the word faith with the word love. Love without works is dead, so too works without love are equally dead. We keep the Torah because we are saved and because we love God, not to earn either. I'll, I'll conclude again by quoting James, the brother of Jesus, because he said it best. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Thank you. Thank you, Seamus, for your closing statement there. Uh, with that being said, um, Protestants, I'm just calling you guys that because you're not part of the same team. So you're just Protestants today. Um, which one of you guys is beginning your closing statements? Uh, Noel, would you like to go first? Uh, Noel, I think you're muted. Totally fine with it. All Actually, right, Noel, not, you. No, <laughs> Noel, take it away, man, and then Jeremiah, you'll close out. You know, just in summaration of everything that we've been talking about, I think it's very clear that Brad and Seamus are demonstrating a spiritual reality that they are making a matter of the flesh a problem. They are trying to say that obedience under the law makes them righteous. They say that you have to adhere to the law and become Jews rather than become Christ. So there's a cognitive dissonance there. Much more, they have a number of other things that have been clearly demonstrated that contradict church history, and they are superseding themselves over 2,000 plus years of church history, which is arrogance and piousness beyond all measure and demonstrates their spiritual father, which is the Pharisees. Um, one thing I wanted to really point out is specifically regarding Mark 17, Christ has declared all foods clean. Now, another argument that they will try to say is this is not, uh, th well, this is a textual variant. They will try to say that, oh, well, maybe Jesus misspoke or it was an addition later. Well, in fact, this is not a textual variant, but defines all plants and creatures as foods. So not just some foods, but all foods, all plants and creatures. Now, even if it were a variant, it would be an early church interpretation of what Jesus intended by the people that stood with the apostles. Otherwise, they would have to take the opposing view that mm, they were just misinformed or misunderstood, which is not according to this. This is affirmed by the early church fathers, Tertullian, Novation, Origen, etc. Go for it, Jeremiah. Sure. Um, again, thank you guys for being here for this debate. I hope this was really fun for you guys. Um, really, one of the things that were stated within this particular uh, debate or in the closing statements was, you know, if we separate Paul from the rest of the New Testament, our, our, our particular positions is done away with. I'm sorry, but we had discussed some of the works of Paul in the in our opening statements. But the most of our conversation was based upon Acts 15 and then Jesus' statements in Matthew. And we held our statements based upon what the books of Acts said. And so second of all, going, going through some of the stuff that, that our opponents have said, basically the, the church fathers completely set themselves away from the Jews because they were anti-Semitic. And uh, Eusebius notes the uh, Torah observance in two forms. I'm not sure what the second one is, but the first one was Ebionism. Ebionism denies the authorship of Paul, the, the, the apostleship of Paul, and uh, the and denied that Jesus was virgin born. So if we're going to say that these people were the true followers of Jesus, you're gonna have some really big problems. And second of all, there was actually one person in the church who was truly anti-Semitic. That guy was Marcion. 
so much so that he completely got rid of the Old Testament and every single church father who interacted with him when he was alive and when he was dead refuted him. Polycarp himself met Marcion and called him a son of the devil. So, so the church truly does not want to get rid of its Jewish roots. But we know the distinction that Christ made between the covenants of the, the covenant of Moses and the covenant of Christ. We see this, as I noted, from the very beginning of the church, from the, the, from the fall of, of the, the, the temple in 70 AD onwards. You truly see a separation of things that made it distinctly Jewish and the things that make it distinct, distinctly Christian. So I hope you guys actually go into the word of God, actually look at what the text says. Don't rely on uh, modern or, or medieval Jewish halakha in order to base your traditions. Look to what the word of God says in its original language, deal with its context to see what the scriptures actually say. And because the church has been doing that for the past 2000 years, the earliest followers of Jesus did not relegate its people to to Torah observance. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremiah. Um, it's always fun when you're, I always feel like the opening word is always exciting for a lot of people, but I always feel like the closing statement, you're just like, yeah, I have made the last, got the last word, yeah. So it always feels good. Um, anyway, the, at this point, audience, my, the you a bunch of like mouthy folks that down there today, good night. Um, I would like to open up this time for Q&A from you guys. Now, so a couple things in the chat. Uh, one, but put at the church split. I'll see it better. Um, also, please say which side you want to answer your question. And in your response to the question, try to keep it uh, between two to five minutes, preferably two, just for the sake of time so we get to as many questions as possible. Um, if you do super chats, yes, of course, you will, um, you will see those uh, first because not only does somebody give money, which some people already have, thank you for filling my next decanter, but uh, <laughs> not only, not only uh, will, will, uh, you, are you giving money, but also it pops up really bright at the very top of the screen here, so it makes it really easy for me to see it. So if you do a super chat, I will see it, um, but not necessarily required. But I will say this real fast before we get to it. Guys, keep the insults down. Um, uh, that's something I'm seeing a lot of in the chats. I don't think insulting and attacking people's faith is necessarily beneficial. Just because somebody doesn't have your particular understanding, you might be right, you might be wrong. Okay, here's somebody out, no need to attack them. I would not have half the friends I have now if I acted out in such a way. So try to remain respectful in your questions. With that being said, let's go in here. All right, whoa, okay, folks. All right, uh, first one I found, uh, Church Split. What is the Torah observant response to the plain reading of Hebrews 8.13? Ah, oh, I knew this would come up. <laughs> So, okay, there's a context that is that is absolutely required. Hebrews 7 through 10 is not about, uh, okay, so first of all, the Old Covenant is not the Torah. The Old Covenant being spoken of in Hebrews 7 through 10 is specifically about the priesthood. That's why he even bothers to bring up the priesthood of Melchizedek in the first place. It has nothing to do with Torah observance. It has everything to do with whether or not Jesus can be a high priest in heaven because he's not a Levite. He's not a Kohen. So he can't be high priest because that promise belongs to the sons of Aaron, and the Levitical priesthood. And that is forever. That's an establishment forever that can't be moved until heaven and earth passed away. Jesus himself affirmed as much. So in Hebrews 8, 13, which if I'm not mistaken, uh, doesn't even contain the word covenant, but it again is in the context of the priesthood. Now the priesthood will eventually pass away. And that is when the Olam Haba, the world to come, eventually does uh, get ushered in after the Messianic era, then there will be a necessary change in the priesthood. The change in the law is the change in the priesthood, not a change in the Torah. The Torah does eventually uh, go away in the world to come, not in the Messianic era. The world to come after heaven and earth have passed away entirely, then everything changes entirely. Everything is totally re reborn and there is no temple at all, as Revelations 22 says. Um, 
But yeah, let me let me open up to Hebrews eight. But I believe that's the passage where the word covenant isn't even present in the uh, in the text. That is, in saying new, he has treated the first as old, but what is being made old is aging and close to vanishing. This is still in the context of talking about the Aaronic priesthood. In saying new, he has treated the first as old. Note the present tense, or rather the future tense language here. But what is being made old and aging is close to vanishing. It is not yet vanished, and it won't vanish until the world, until the heaven and earth have both passed away, just as according to uh, Yeshua's words in Matthew 5, 17. Thank you very much. We have a super chat for the negative side. What are the requirements of Messiah according to scripture and according to... Uh, to the Bible, is the Messiah allowed to annul Torah laws? Noel, do you want to take care of this one or should I? Well, the the requirements of Messiah, according to scripture, is multitudes. Jesus says he has come to fulfill everything that is written of him. Uh, one of them plainly is to be the suffering servant. One of them is to teach the full, the, the full meaning of the law, to fulfill the law, th things of that nature. And so what, what Jesus does, he does not annul the moral requirements of the law as he talks about. It. However, there is, as we see, even in the Old Testament, a distinction between keeping the commandments of God and things like sacrifices. So, so Jesus said, um, the, the, the scriptures say that obedience is better than sacrifice, but I thought sacrifice was a part of obedience. Scripture distinguishes between the two and places obedience to God's moral commands higher than the simple performance of sacrifice. Thank you, Jeremiah. I have another super chat. Um, whoop, whoop, come on, let's move. Oh yeah, uh, Protestants, if Yeshua had removed the Torah, wouldn't that make him a false prophet according to Deuteronomy chapter 12? There it is up on the screen for you guys. Again, the Torah hasn't been removed. It's been fulfilled. It's done what it was purposed to do. Again, it's still present as in a tutor pointing to Christ, pointing to our need for Christ. The purpose of the Torah, the law, was to magnify sin and demonstrate how we all fall short of the glory of God and why Christ is the final sacrifice. Right. Where nothing what, what, has been removed, it's been fulfilled. The underlying assertion is that well the under the underlying presupposition is that there is no distinction within within the law and a person cannot make distinctions within the law however i believe scripture does and as the westminster confession and the 1689 confession notes in the confession as well as the scripture references there are distinctions between the moral ceremonial and civil the ceremonial are fulfilled in christ and the body politic ceased to exist in the destruction of the temple when Israel ceased to be a physical nation. So, so to say that Christ set across the Torah, no, that's not his job. But we see over time that the apostles who followed Christ understood that particular things would pass away. All right, we have another question. What do the Torah observers think Jesus meant when he called himself the Son of Man? Is he not claiming to be the Son of Man in Daniel? Uh, on the so, yeah, even in Daniel, Son of Man is not a messianic title. That's something that comes later with Christian writing. Uh, Son of Man, as far as the whole of Tanakh is concerned and the rest of Judaic literature, uh, means human being. In the case of Daniel, uh, it is speaking about the Messiah, who is a particular human being. So you might be able to argue that. Uh, but in, in this case, uh, still, S Son of Man is human being that's it's a it's a hebrew juxtaposition okay well it, it there's a, there's a little bit of context because it depends he sometimes uses it to refer to himself but there are other times where he does use it in the way that he just means to say humans or mankind uh an example of this is when he said the son of man is lord of the sabbath in the context of that conversation he's talking about mankind he's not talking about himself real quick i have one something to break the levity and i'm going to pick on seamus my friend, who's from Northern Ireland, wants to know, did Seamus switch to Judaism to bypass the question if he's Protestant or Catholic? <laughs> <laughs> I heard you're a Protestant now, Father. <laughs> like, 
like, <laughs> if my family Seamus, found out I was Protestant, I'd be disowned. <laughs> Seamus is like, huh, how the turntables now try to pin me down. Uh, <laughs> Loopholes. <laughs> so um, Emily Prince, uh, she asks this, if the holy days and Sabbath are not to be kept, why are they being uh, going to be in force in the millennium? Isaiah 66 and Zechariah 14. Do you want to take that or should I? Well, I would, I would, I would say specifically that you're, you're not interpreting it properly. Uh, could you pull the question back up, please? I kind of just so sorry. I reading. Yeah, no. Um, first of all, you're assuming the millennial kingdom is in, this is part of eschatology in regards to your understanding of the covenant and there's, I mean, the amillennialist view and so on and so forth. It's either future tense in regards to it hasn't been fulfilled until the end of time, or it was a prophecy in regards to that first century of what happened with the early church and so on and so forth when his spirit was poured out and so on and so forth. Uh, the Sabbath has been kept because Christ is our Sabbath and we are keeping those things and all days are holy inside of the Lord. I want to speak specifically on the, the interpretation of Zechariah chapter 14. I mean, completely going aside the, 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 the assumption of a pre-millennial eschatology, which of course uh, would not work with a post-millennial or amillennial like myself. It, it presupposes that this, this prophecy is to be held literally and not referring to the church, uh, which is composed of both Jews and Gentiles reigning under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, which has been interpreted in, in such a way. And even then I would not, I would not put prophecy or a particular interpretation of prophecy as an as a hermeneutical argument for your position, because I mean, prophecy can go either way, either literally or figuratively as we see in scripture. So I would not use this as a good argument for someone who is already assumed Torah observance and holds that position. Sure. That could be a good argument for, but, but I don't believe that that is a good one uh, to convince those who are not having that position. All right. Captain Calvinist is asking a really good question here uh, to alternate media. When looking at the sacrifice as the fulfillment of the law, why would sacrifices continue if Christ was the last? That that actually is the same question that I had when I asked why Paul continued in the sacrificial system in Acts 21. So essentially, uh, it's, but to answer the question... Um, <laughs> With a counter question, something just to think about as a viewer. None of the sacrifices are for intentional sin. Not one. You can search through the, the entire of Leviticus. There are two uh, sacrifices called the sin offering and the guilt offering, but they clarify these are for unintentional sins. There is no sacrifice for intentional sins at all. And the rest of the offerings of the five, the other three are volunteer offerings. You bring them because you want to. The Passover lamb is a peace offering, for example. It has nothing to do with sin. So it, the counter question is this. If Yeshua replaces the earthly temple sacrifices, which is a position we do not hold, but if he does, which ones do he replace? Does he replace the Thanksgiving offerings, the ones that are voluntary? Or does he replace the Passover offering because he is a Passover lamb, which is not a sin offering? So then did he, did he die for your sins if he's a Passover lamb? And of the sin offerings that are offered, which are only for unintentional sins, uh, if he replaces those, then you still have the problem of intentional sin. And Hebrews 10 does talk about how with, with intentional sin, there is no sacrifice. Uh, and so th there's, there's part of this uh, context within the sacrificial system itself that not a lot of Christians understand how the, the, how the temple system operates. And so that's part of the confusion when you say words like Jesus is the perfect sacrifice, a statement we agree with. Uh, but not everyone understands what that means because they already don't understand how the temple system works to begin with. And so there is a context that is being missing from the statement. Uh, and we just assume that that means he replaced them all when rather he is a type and a shadow of the heavenly temple. The earthly one is for the earthly realm. Uh, an example I would say is um, if, if you are caught speeding, you still have to pay the speeding fine. If you are caught murdering, then you still have to pay the death penalty. Yeshua died for your sins and you are paid for, you are justified and righteous should you repent from that sin, but your body still has to pay for the sin it conducted here on earth. Your soul is saved, but your body still needs to pay for what it did, and that's why the death penalty is a thing. 
So it, he doesn't, his sacrifice doesn't get rid of the earthly temple sacrifices. That is for your physical state. His, his offering is for your soul in heaven in the heavenly temple, which is why the, the priesthood of Melchizedek is so important in Hebrews chapter 8 and 9. So, okay. Um, now, uh, Alicia Deutsch, I, I want to say, it's, it, Ethan, text me later and make sure I know how to pronounce your stinking name. Anyway, um, Alicia Deutsch, uh, clarifying question for an earlier question for the Torah observers. If the bread is a substitute for the lamb sacrifice, then what is circumcision still be required to partake? I know you guys kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but if we could do a quick answer, that'd be great. Right. Uh, that is not something that is outlined in the same Talmudic tractate where it is ruled that the afikomen can stand as a substitute for the lamb. Uh, now, admittedly, I've not read the totality of the Talmud, so there may be a ruling somewhere that does mention something like that, uh, but it would seem to be out of place not to be in Kiddushin 20. Uh, so I would, I would wager to say at this point, no. Yeah, so there's no requirement to be circumcised to celebrate the holiday wherever you are in the world. The only requirement is for circumcision if you want to eat the Passover lamb that was offered on the altar at the temple. In order to do that, then you have to be sacrificed. But to just celebrate the Passover lamb in your home, wherever you are in the world, there's no requirement for a circumcision. Y'all are so long-winded in your answers usually, so it's hard to get to everybody. So I'm, I'm only <laughs> getting the chance to hit the super chat. So everyone else, I'm sorry. I wish we could. Um, and apparently people are now like super obsessed with the Torah observant. The next uh, super chat says, question for the positive. Could you comment your thoughts on Hosea 6.6? Is that the one being quoted from Galatians? Do you want to pull that hey, one up? I, feel I, like can, I got it right here if you want me to read it. Yeah, go ahead. I trust so, you. Yeah. <laughs> It's uh, Hosea 6.6, 6, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Yes, so this is actually blatantly addressing the issue which James himself addresses, right? Obedience without love is more or less worthless, and this is actually a principle that's drawn out in the Tanya that we see take place actually in Acts chapter 10. Um, where the desire to fulfill a command, if you are absolutely incapable of doing so, that the, that command is then merited to you as though you had done it. Now, that is granted that you are incapable of doing so. Uh, whereas, likewise, as Yeshua points out uh, at the Sermon on the Mount, right, that, that, that not physically committing a sin, but doing so in the mind also, so it works in the reverse. Um, but that's not to negate the obedience of the commands. That is to indicate that the love that you feel for God, which would beget such obedience, can credit to you that obedience if you are unable to physically do that obedience. Okay, uh, Captain Calvinist again says alternate media. <laughs> we have so Captain Cal Calvinist uh, Jeremiah. He's representing you, your team right now. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, De Dennis is um, Dennis is really uh, open minded, or not necessarily open minded, but he's really opinionated on these particular things. So it's it's hard to get him to be quiet on things. We love Dennis. <laughs> I, I can respect that. I, I too I have mean, the same I, problem. I, I love. I love Dennis. I mean, he's, he's, he's awesome. So Captain Kelvinus was saying, uh, ultimate media last question, spending my college money, bro. Why? Um, anyway, wouldn't that be null and void when we are told Christ is the forgiveness of all sins? It depends on the jurisdiction you're talking about, right? As my colleague earlier stated, uh, the earthly temple here is for here on, on this world in, in, in this world. All right. What, what, what we call Olam Haze, right? That's this world. Olam Haba, the world to come, that is where Yeshua's sacrifice takes effect, not for here. And uh, an example that I love to use to illustrate this is so Ted Bundy, right? Ted Bundy did a number of awful, terrible things, and so he was executed for it. Now, if he had repented and found Christ prior to his execution, does that mean that we shouldn't have executed him? No, we absolutely still should have executed him because his crimes were committed here in this world. However, in the next life, he may find grace. 
Okay, so uh, bought by blood. What's up, John? Oh, uh, what's up, John? <laughs> what's up, buddy? Uh, he says for everyone knows bought by blood three sixteen. If you're on TikTok, he's a lot of fun. Um, he says for both sides. Finally, someone not, not just taking pot shots at alternate media. Um, uh, it was funny because at first I was like, oh my goodness, the Torah crowd is is trying to attack the Protestants, and then it switched around. So it was funny. All right, it's a, it's always a pendulum swing. Yeah, yeah. It, that's whatever know what's coming all right both sides why will animal sacrifice be reinstated in the millennial kingdom according to ezekiel chapter 40 through 43 so why do you think i answered that question i think we kind of did but if anyone wants to do a brief overview if if that is the correct exegesis it would only be demonstrating their rejection of christ as the first and final sacrifice for sin so the idea that we would need to be need to have a literal physical temple on earth to continue on when those things have already been filled, they're a type and shadow, it, it would make no sense. So just to clarify, you are a millennial, correct? Yes. Okay. Yep. So that uh, for the for the audience, um, th- this is a thing. Uh, so me and Brad are premillennialists. Uh, we believe in a literal thousand year reign and a literal kingdom that will come. That affects the way that you exegete other passages such as this one. Whereas if you are a millennial or post millennial, then the meaning behind these same exact texts are going to change because of the, uh, the lens by which you, you approach the text. So um, j- just to clarify, uh, I just wanted to make sure that I was uh, correct in making um, the assumption that you were a millennial. And so I just want the audience to be aware that there's a bias here and we openly admit our biases. And so that's just going to change. The, the answer will change depending on your, uh, the way you come to it. Well, eschatology, I think I can speak for everyone here. Eschatology is a very broad topic. It's a very different topic a, a, a lot of times. Um, I mean, does, do we have any preterists in the house? Okay. Oh, gosh. Partial preterists. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway. Um, I, mean, I, I, I was just going to make the small comment that this really goes to show that not only theology matters, but eschatology matters. Uh, yeah, well, I'm a pan millennialist. I believe it all It'll pan, all out, pan in out in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I've done a lot of study on eschatology, and a lot of po- there's a lot of solid points on a lot of various sides. I am very, fl- I'm very cool with being uh, chilling out with people who are of a different uh, eschatology. Um, have Brad and Seamus ever sinned intentionally? This is a complete sinner's guide to the super chat. Uh, yes, I can. Yeah, say- it happens. Uh, yeah. Of course, it happens to I everybody. Think, <laughs> I think you're. Uh, I'm not sure if that point really stands as much. You think though, their their point is that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice for intentional sin, whereas the sacrificial system was for unintentional sin. Right. Um, I'm actually doing an entire paper right now on the ransom theory of the atonement, and I actually pull that pull through that a little bit. So, all right, <laughs> Jesus is my Lord. Seventy two. Uh, she says, Torah observers, uh, I almost said two and I was like two Matthew 20. Oh, Torah observers. Got it. Uh, where in scripture are we told to observe Mosaic law in Colossians two sixteen and 21, Paul calls Sabbath and feast regulations. What are your thoughts on the scriptures? I'm not yeah. sure if I'm understanding the question fully. Yeah. I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to the Colossians, Brad, if you want to open to Matthew 28. Yeah. God eats peanut butter cookies. There it is. <laughs> I have always remembered that ever since you've done that. <laughs> Colossians 2, uh, right, 16. And that is all the way to, oh, all right. Anyway, therefore, do not let anyone pass judgment in matters of food or drink or respect to a festival or a new moon or Shabbat. These are a foreshadowing of the things, but the reality is Messiah. Uh, all the way to 21. I don't, okay. For the sake of um, being true to the question, I will read all the way. Let no one disqualify you by insisting on false humility and worship of angels, going into detail about what he has seen, puffed up without cause uh, by his fleshy mind. He is not withholding fast to the head. It is from him that the whole body nourished and held together um, by its joints and tendons grow with a godly increase. If you died with the Messiah to the basic precepts of the world, why, as though as through living in the world, do you subject yourselves to their rules? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All right, so um, real quickly, 
uh, in, in, the, in the context of Colossians, um, I, I, I'm having a brain fart in, in what it's called. It's the guys that uh, uh, abstain from everything. Uh, I can't remember what that's, uh, what that's called right now. It's the uh, opposite of a hedonist. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's it's a particular uh, philosophy that's prevalent in in Colossia at this time. Gnostics. Um, no, they weren't Gnosticism, 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 proto Gnostics. No, it, they basically they, all they do is deny themselves. They fast all the, the time. The they ascetics. Don't... The ascetics. Yeah. E- each so, each each of those groups would have participated in asceticism. Yeah, asceticism. So um, we so uh, now from our point of view, just and this is gonna again this is a this verse, especially this first opening verse, is going to depend uh, how you approach the scripture will obviously uh, give you a different meaning. So if you are a pro Torah observer such as myself, therefore do not let anyone pass judgment on you in matters of food or drink, kosher laws, in respect to a festival or new moon. New moon is the first of the month and like Passover or a Sabbath for observing the Sabbath. For these are a foreshadowing of the things to come and the reality is the Messiah. We do these because they are a shadow uh, of the coming return of the Messiah. So we do them as reminders. Uh, we do them because they are things that Messiah did, because they are a type and a shadow. Uh, and we shouldn't let anyone judge us for those things. Uh, again, now, if you come from an anti-Torah position, it's the other way around. So that, it, the, um, it kind of depends on how you approach the scripture. It will depend on whether you see it as negative or positive. Right. So the, to, to, to touch on Matthew 28, right? And this is actually where the, the seeming conflict between Yeshua and Paul is going to uh, really come to bear and where Second Peter 3.16 really needs to be taken into account. Uh, so Matthew 28.20 uh, says, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. Uh, even into the end of the in, unto the end of the world. So, what are the things that he taught them to observe? Well, we have the example in Matthew five seventeen through twenty, where he is clearly teaching them to both observe and teach the Torah. Uh, we also have Matthew twenty three one through three, where he commands them to observe that which the Pharisees command them. Um, so, to to then read Paul's words in a contradiction to that, because the Pharisees doubtlessly would have taught obedience to the festivals and to the Sabbath and kosher law and what have you. And if Jesus is teaching us to observe those things which the Pharisees teach, then we, we have an inherent conflict here if we're going to read Paul's words in conflict with that. Uh, and this is where the Torah-centric position on on what Paul said, as, as Seamus just gave, is actually what unifies the text rather than creates a contradiction. All right. Finally, a super chat at the negative after a long break. (laughs) Uh, I just don't want people. Look, guys, I'm literally taking them as they come. I am not being a mis like bias here. Okay, I'm not just trying to attack Torah people or uh, or give all the ammo to the Torah people. I just know how the Internet works. So I'm just letting you know as they come through, I get to them. Uh, Negative. How does. Perke Avat um, Avat show how Second Temple Judaism, therefore Jesus and the rabbis, understood or fulfill and abolish. Okay to ask alternate media facetious. Not sure if I fully understand the question. So he's, he's basically because think, w- yeah, uh, what what, what he's explaining is that because Perke Avot is a document that outlines Second Temple Judaism, um, and uh, which it's it's the teachings of the fathers. Uh, more or less, and it gives us a first century Jewish idea of what the terms fulfill and abolish mean to a first century Jew. Um, so Pirkei Avot is just a list of sayings. It's a lot like the book of James, and it's about like five or six chapters long. It's really not super long, and it's like a it's like a small Proverbs book. It's a tractate from the Mishnah, um, and Pirkei Avot just means sayings of the fathers uh, so, so i mean it seems like one would have had to have read read this entirely to be able to properly answer this question anyway right so if you haven't it, read the document it's almost I've, like I've, it's, i personally have read parts of it but not the whole of it so i i as a as a scholar i would not be um my conscience would not allow me to speak on something that i haven't fully read <laughs> I, I, that's respectable. I'm, I'm the same way where I'm like, ah, I don't know anything about that, so I'm not going to. All right, guys, we're going to start <laughs> cutting off comments, okay? So uh, I'll get to the 
Uh, last super chat, I think here, don't do any more super chats. Don't spend more money. Um, and then uh, at Buck, if Christ was first, and oh, so specifically you, my friend. Specifically me. All right. At Buck, if Christ was the first and final sacrifice, why did Paul offer sacrifice as a temple for his purification process if it, had not, it did not include a sin sacrifice? Didn't we address this earlier in the debate? I think a we did, bit, yes. yeah. And, and the point I was trying to convey is that Paul was not in opposition to the law in the sense that, you know, he was a antinomian. He was not lawless. But the reason why he did those things was not because he had to, otherwise he wasn't being obedient to Christ, otherwise he wasn't being obedient to God. The sole purpose was him demonstrating what Christ has called us to fulfill, the greatest commandment, to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So for the sake of fellowship, as I talked about in regards to the analogy I gave in my opening statement regarding alcohol and so forth, it was a matter of their conscience and was being perceived as lawless, perceived as something that was contradictory, but it wasn't in reality. So we did that for their fellowship. Okay, thank you for answering that. I'm trying to get to some of these have been, uh, I mean, Captain Kelvin is uh, another one by him. I just was like, oh, I, I clicked on him again. Dang, I'm not trying. I, I, he just asks good questions. He goes, He's everywhere. He goes, I'm broke. If covenant, it, but he is asking for the Protestants. If the covenant is continuous, why would the practice of the law change if there is no precedence for it to? I'm being fair here. Mm -hmm. Good call, man. Okay, fair enough. Well, and that's just because see. you came in hot. I will let, let's let's ha let this one be answered because you came in hot at alternate media. So let's at least let you guys fairly answer the question. <laughs> I mean that that would that in and of itself would presuppose that there is no. Uh, there is no precedence for it. Um, Paul, who understood the law better than anyone, says that the law was given for a purpose, for the sake of transgressions, and until the the coming faith would come. And now that we are, um, now that Christ has come, we are not under a, a pedagogue. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. And of course, we have uh, passages in relation to the book of Hebrews that aspects of the law are set aside because of their uselessness, not because of anything in them. The law is good. But the problem was with us. So we are looking for a better hope, uh, Christ. I think I can easily nail this, uh, answer this next question real quick to the Protestants, and then we'll close up shop. Okay. Uh, and then I have one more question I'm going to ask all of you. Um, to Protestants, what is your position about progressive Christianity? Trash. It's Absolute garbage. Trash. It's garbage. I mean, I, it's one, actual one, lawlessness. Exactly. <laughs> one of the things that I said back when I was starting um, work on TikTok, as a, as a Reformed Christian, what I've seen from the progressive Christians, and really, if you want to look at progressive Christianity, look at Reverend Brandon Robertson. And, and really, progressive Christianity is... Baptized. I just threw up in my mouth. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Progressive Christianity in two words is baptized liberalism. They claim the name of Christ, but they do not have anything in relation to him. Um, it, it's just as Jesus says, um, they, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You can name the name of Christ all you want. You can call yourself a Christian. But if you don't believe anything that the church has ever agreed on, like at all, Something's wrong. Yeah, it's bad. Progressive Christianity is trash, and they should feel bad. All right, um, my <laughs> my <laughs> final question. Um, uh, the, hey, something we're all united on. Hey, check that out. All right, so um, my next question. This was asked by someone earlier in the chat, and forgive me, so uh, whoever you were, I don't remember who you were. There's a lot going on in there, but I thought this was a great question to be objective. Um, what do you think? And I want all of you to answer it quickly, okay? So and I'll start with Seamus because you're the first one on my screen. What do you think is the best argument against your position? Ooh. Mm. We're gonna force us to be uh, force ourselves to be objective here. <clears throat> okay, all right. The problem is I know too much about the contexts of Paul. Uh, so I'm trying to think of one that's one that's actually really good. Um, hmm. Yeah, you put me on the spot. 
If Brad, if you if you actually have one in mind, give me a second to think about it. Um, but if you have one, go ahead. Feel free to speak up. And uh, this, uh, I'm I'm, I'm going to go for a short, sweet one because of the simplicity of it. Um, granted, the the devil's in the details and the language that's used in the actual manuscript, but uh, Christ is the end of the law. Uh, I think is is one of the one of the ones that is probably the most direct if coming from that premise. Uh, and it, it, it only comes into problems when you actually uh, start to unravel what the word telos actually means. We asked the best argument now for you to refute it. Now, so um, I'm trying to, okay. So I, I'm trying to remember where this is. Um, and maybe my, uh, my, uh, my friends here below will point me in the right direction. I think it's in one of the epistles of John where he says uh, for something like, you know, this is how we know that we love Christ, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not a, uh, not a burden. And then it says like immediately after, and and the commandments are this to love, to love each other. Uh, And I think that would be uh, essentially the position would be, would be made that, um, uh, that every time you see to keep his commandments, it's not in reference to Torah. It's in fact, in reference to the one command to love your neighbor as yourself. I think that's, a more solid position that's a little bit harder to uh, to attack without like some serious uh, discussion for hours and hours on on that particular. So I would say that's that's probably the best avenue to approach our position. That's the hardest for us to refute. All right, uh, Mr. Rogers, would you uh, Buck Rogers, would you like to go and say what you think is their best argument? For Torah observance, or uh, forgive me. Correct. Yes, for Torah observance. What do you think is your the best argument that you've heard uh, from the opposing side? Honestly, I have <laughs> I I don't see any. I don't see an argument that that holds water. To be honest, you don't because have a. You would, and- you, you would have to. You would have to take things out of its context in regards to Christ fulfillment and so on and so forth i mean if you wanted to say the other way in regards to i think our best argument and we've demonstrated it here is the requirement of circumcision be a part of the family of god in the old covenant that they want to turn back to which rejects the spiritual circumcision of the heart and new creation new birth by the power of god through the holy spirit so you really don't think there's a singular good argument on the opposing side what about you, Jeremiah? What do you think? Um, really, the I've I've seen parts of it, but I haven't read it in full. And I think the the argument of connecting the per, uh, the perke of vote to I guess uh, the the interpretation of abolish and fulfill probably could be one of the strongest ones for Torah observance. I haven't looked at it yet, but I I think if I research it a little bit more, you could you could try to build a case for that. And I think that that case would be pretty strong. I, I would I would have to take time in refuting that. Fair enough. I might retract my answer. Oh, okay. I, think I, I will actually I will I will extend an olive branch. I love the fact that there is a and this I'm sure Jeremiah will affirm as well. I love that we want to go into the Old Testament as it points to Christ. That's the argument that we're trying to convey, that it all points to Christ. We don't worship the Torah. We don't worship the old covenant. We have a new and better covenant in Christ Jesus. Those things are a type and shadow. Now, the, the, the argument that I would say is probably thinking about a little bit more that they probably have a little bit better uh, grasp on is uh, Christ's uh, adherence to Torah. However, I think they are radically misinterpreting the purposes of him fulfilling Torah on our behalf. Again, uh, the best argument, not refuting it. Come on, people. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's <I'm laughs> yeah. really Brad, hard not to do that. <laughs> Brad, Brad, we're, 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 in, we're in the debate scene. It, it's, yeah. it's in our blood. We've been doing yeah. it for almost, uh, almost two hours. Give us go, some slack. <laughs> go to your respective corners. Um, no, just kidding. Okay. Personally, and I'll, I, I, I'll, do I'll with StreamYard. Sorry. Uh, that's true. You actually could. <laughs> so, like, just separate them on the screen. Bad. Um, now, I th- personally think uh, that the our best argument in Torah observance is Jesus saying, "I have not come to 
abolish said law. I think that's the best argument because I think you first have to seriously intellectually deal with that if you're going to say otherwise. I think the best argument usually on the Protestant side is going to one, be on how they define that same ex exact passage, just like the Torah observant, but also I think Gal a place like Galatians, like, you know, you dealing with how Paul talks about the law. Um, and then, of course, that's where oh, Seamus is going to go context, you know, Jewish Pharisee. I understand. I'm just saying what the best ones, that best places are, okay? Put the guns down. All right. So um, I know, I know Seamus. We're friends. It's fine. Um, <laughs> so now, with all that being said, Okay, a lot of things were said in the comment section. Some of y'all need to go get right uh, <laughs> because <laughs> some of the behavior was wow, just wow. I would oh, just just wow. Okay, like some of y'all need to learn how to have a civil discussion. Um, I, so, I, I need to go pray after seeing some of this stuff. I know. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, never mind. If you need uh, it well, song <laughs> <laughs> I need ashes and sackcloth, okay? I'm going straight old school after some of that. Um, Let's take everything they say and always put it in the negative and the opposite of what they actually said. Oh, dude. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, too, because other people, it was so funny to be like, Protestants crushed him, and then, like, freaking Torah murdered him. I'm like, all right, y'all, chill out. Like, you're, it's always that respect of rooting for your side. But let it go. On, on a serious note, though, here, um, I think there is right ways and wrong ways to have conversations. And I do think there is times where we could dig in our heels, we could take a few swings. But guys, if we aren't willing to have these conversations, sit down and do so respectfully, then there's no point in even engaging. I mean, just think about the way some of you guys engaged in the chat today. Think of how some things even in the debate could have been discussed better. When you think about that, do you think, and the way you act that way, do you think anyone's going to hear your opposing argument? No, they're going to dig in their heels yeah. and they're just going to blow you off. So if you guys want to have a proper apologetic, if you guys have want to reason the faith properly, I would recommend that you guys, instead of acting offended at every turn and just be like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you said that. What about this? Not everyone's using it with your, frame, your framework. We have to understand that we all are using scripture and we all want to understand scripture, but no matter what, <laughs> presuppositions of interpretation go into scripture, as we talked about with eschatology. This is why I get a lot of crap from people where I say philosophy precedes theology. And it's not because I think theology is less important than philosophy. It's because literally your philosophical framework is going to influence your theology. Um, so for, for example, we have a Nazarene and a, and a Calvinist here, or a Presbyterian. So no matter what, they're going to read Romans 9 differently. There's going to be a philosophical framework that is applied over it. Uh, and it's not always bad. You need a philosophy. I mean, if you have no philosophy, you have no understanding of reality by definition. So anyway, my rant's over. <laughs> um, so Will got his in. I got right. mine in. Right. I got, it's just something I, I, it drives me absolutely crazy. So um, mainly because like when I am... Uh, Dustin Hall, I'll give you your shameless plug, okay? Tour observing Kentucky and on TikTok, hashtag shameless plug. That's funny. I'll, I'll let that one slide. Um, <laughs> go follow him too, apparently. Um, but I mean, I, so just real quick, I know it's your debate time, but honestly, as someone who was raised in an extreme group of Baptists, okay, I was raised independent, fundamental Baptist, King James only, bless God, pre-millennial uh, rapture, Ooh. blood covered sin, bless God, hellfire, brimstone, let's go. I was That's where I was raised, okay? Same with Brad. Two of my mentors were those guys. Can't wear shorts. <laughs> yes. Boys and girls walk on opposite sides of the street. Women because they look like pregnant if they're on the same. Trim the edges of your beard. Can't yes. wear pants. <laughs> whoa, whoa, no, we didn't have beards. Beards were sinful. Oh, <laughs> Jesus, that's, that's right. right. Yeah. You can't even yeah. have facial yeah. hair. Crew cut. Everything military standard. <laughs> so Jesus turned water into grape juice. Yes, those ones. <laughs> and, uh, now now we're back substitute. to camaraderie. I like it. But remember, <laughs> like, juice. I look back at my changes in theology, and it's only because someone didn't dig in their heels and just blast me. 
Um, in fact, it was actually there. I was talking to a reformed co uh, covenant the uh, theologian pastor uh, when I was just out of Bible college. And this guy said, like, blasted me so hard. He said things I, can't, I won't repeat on live stream. Like, I just honestly to this day, I'm like, wow, that was a pastor. Wow, that's crazy. But I remember it put a fire under me to start learning more. Um, and I actually ended up shifting my positions. I ended up agreeing with them on certain things and disagreeing with them on other stills, but now I'm more educated. But guys, if you guys actually want people to listen to you, you, you got to actually have a discourse. Uh, and also, so which actually reminds me, if you have questions about their respective positions, Alternate Media Seamus, Alternate Media Brad, The Black Doctor, and Buck Rogers, if you want to di just talk with them, follow them at the respective platforms. I know for a fact they will uh, answer you when and if they can. Um, I know that for a fact because I've texted Brad and Seamus at multiple hours of the night, random questions, um, and they do answer me. And uh, Buck Rogers has answered me in the comments. And Black Doctor, you and I, this is our like, first interactions really together, it is. but, but um, you're a cool dude. I like you. So, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I get questions all the time at, at all amount of the hours of the night, and I always try to try to answer, especially when I first get it. Exactly. So, guys, I know we couldn't get to all the questions, and I'm so sorry. Also, Andrew does apologetics. I'm so excited to see you here in our chat. That was super cool. Um, he put really in two more work. dollars with his I broke know. money. <laughs> Dennis, oh. please. Dennis, what are you doing? <laughs> Den you Dennis, what? Bro, Dennis, no. <laughs> We want you to eat tomorrow, guy. <laughs> Bro, Migo, send me, email us your email, uh, like your to your pay stuff to your uh, PayPal or something. I'm going to refund you your money. <laughs> like, Let's start a stop on your bro <laughs> college. I'm waiting for him to come back with like, well, I don't need to eat tomorrow. Man does not live off of bread alone. <laughs> yes, I was going to say that. <laughs> Link in the bio to GoFundMe for Captain Calvinist. <laughs> yeah, we're going to need it. All right, guys. Well, if that was, uh, if you guys are good with it, I'm cool leaving it all here. Um, let us know your thoughts in the actual comments below. Uh, let us know who you thought won, what you thought was interesting observations. Um, yeah, just let us know your thoughts and uh, keep it respectful, okay? All right. Let's just be decent human beings. All right, guys. With that being said, thank you for checking us out. Go follow Alternate Media, both Brad and Seamus. Go follow The Black Doctor 21 on TikTok and at his YouTube channel, The Black Doctor. And, of course, Noel Roberts at Buck Rogers. You'll have a great time. They're a lot of fun. They're very entertaining. So with that being said, everyone take care and God bless.